Okay, hello everyone. Hello. Hello and welcome to New America. It is such a pleasure to have you here. We're so happy. Uh, this is our, our first in-person public event since March of 2020 and we're just so thankful and grateful to be able to share this space with you. So thank you for coming and welcome to all of our guests online. We are thrilled that you are joining us today and we're looking forward to engaging with you too in our question and answer periods. Um, so we're here today to talk about jobs and to talk about how states and cities can leverage historic federal investments in infrastructure to create more good jobs and to make sure people in their community from all backgrounds can get into those good jobs. My name is Mary Alice McCarthy and I direct the Center on Education and Labor here at New America and I'll be your driver, your conductor today. Uh, at the Center, we research, we, we research the intersection of policies of our Pardon me, let me try that again. At the Center on Education and Labor, we focus our research on the intersection of education and workforce development policies that prepare people for good jobs and careers and help them access those jobs, and then the labor and employment policies that shape, that shape the quality of those jobs and make sure whether or not they're good jobs. We believe that all Americans should have access to high quality, affordable education. We also believe that all Americans should be in jobs that are good family, family sustaining jobs, regardless of their educational level. So it's a great time to be thinking about these issues because over the last two years, the federal government has made historic job generating investments in infrastructure, clean energy, manufacturing, broadband access, and more. For all of us who are committed to building a more just economy, we have an opportunity, and I would even say an obligation, to make the most of these investments. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who are going to help us think through what does it mean to connect these federal dollars to really good jobs and make sure that lots of people have access to them. We have senior officials from three federal agencies, the Departments of Labor, Transportation, and Commerce. We have the mayor of Rochester, Minnesota, who has already been doing a lot of work on creating a good jobs economy for her residents. And we have a fantastic lineup of worker advocates and community-based practitioners who are also working with their local electeds to make sure that investments, state, federal, and local, go to making good jobs available to all people. So with that, I'm going to just do a little bit of table setting around these investments and around this sort of problem and challenge of good jobs. So let me start here. Um, let me start here. Um, just don't want to fall off my little stool here. I'm feeling exceptionally tall today. It's very exciting. Okay. So as I said, there, this has been an incredible two years of federal investment in infrastructure, really just unprecedented almost, right? So just quickly, uh, in March of 2021, right, right after the Biden administration had been sworn in, we, um, we got the American Rescue Plan. Uh, came through Congress and was signed by the President. This was a $1.9 trillion investment in many things. Mostly this was to, you know, this was an emergency response to the pandemic and to help states and cities sort of help their residents weather this very, very difficult time when jobs were, when restaurants and businesses were closing and schools were closing. Um, but there was a significant amount of money in there too that could go to infrastructure investments and the $350 billion state and local rescue fund, for example, did have funds that can be invested in water, sewer and broadband infrastructure and we're already seeing some of that happening. Um, the American Rescue Plan also sets aside $500 million for something called the Good Jobs Challenge, which is a competitive grant program run by the Department of Commerce. And we're going to hear more about that and how the Department of Commerce is, is working with communities to spur good job development. These investments had just started. They're going to be rolling out for the next five to eight years. So there's a long tail on all of these investments, right? So we're just beginning to see the impact, but we're really beginning to see the impact of the American Rescue Plan, which has already been credited for restoring and creating four million jobs and averting a prolonged double dip recession. And that's from Moody Analytics that comes up with those numbers. Um, so after the American Rescue Plan in 2021 in November, uh, Congress passed and the President signed the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, okay. And this was a $1.4 trillion investment and this one very specifically in infrastructure with $550 billion of new spending on fixing roads, bridges, railways, airports, water ports, clean energy, broadband and more. 
The Economic Policy Institute estimates that for each year for the next five years, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act will generate 770,000 new jobs, right? And the majority of those jobs will be subject to federal rules main mandating high wages and supporting local unions. And we'll talk a little bit more on that later. Okay. And then next we have the Chips and Science Act, which passed just this last August, and there's $50 billion that is going to uh, help uh, build uh, the semiconductor manufacturing industry in the United States, um, and that is very exciting. Um, and again, according to the Semiconductor Industry Association, they expect this act to create uh, 180,000 construction jobs each year for the next five years, and then 280,000 permanent jobs in the semiconductor industry. And then finally, we had, last but hardly least, we had the Inflation Reduction Act, right, which is $74 billion um, and is absolutely historic generation-defining investments in clean energy and climate mitigation strategies and is expected to generate millions of jobs. According to the Blue-Green Alliance, the law could create up to 9 million jobs uh, over the next decade. So that is a lot of jobs, right, and an incredible opportunity. And as I said, we're already beginning to see the impact specifically of the American Res Rescue Act and bipartisan infrastructure bill. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, monthly job growth in 2020 has averaged 420,000 jobs a month. That is a tremendous pace of job development, of job growth. And again, these investments are just getting started. So this is a huge opportunity. Good jobs are at the center of the Biden administration's agenda, and we need to think about what that means. And I will say, when they talk about this, they talk about good jobs. And they're not alone. It seems like everyone's talking about good jobs these days. You, you sort of can't go anywhere in Washington without hearing about good jobs. There's a good jobs initiative, the good jobs principles, the good jobs challenge, and on and on. So why is all of a sudden everybody talking about good jobs? Well, it might sound kind of, at some level it's a lack of originality and we're all very tired. But I think the bigger reason, <laughs> I think the bigger reason is that this is really sort of the culmination of a decade's worth of research that has shown without sort of, you know, that has really documented painstakingly the declining quality of jobs in the United States. This term good jobs has taken on such salience because the reality is in the United States today, a job is no guarantee of avoiding poverty, of avoiding bankruptcy, or of not landing in some sort of extreme economic precarity. Just to put some numbers on this, a study by Martha Ross and her partners at the, uh, at the Brookings Institute in 2019 found that 53 million, Ameri or 53 million people in the United States, 44% of all workers are low wage workers. They make $10 or less in, uh, in our labor market. That's, that's inching up on half of all workers. And more than half of those 53 million workers are prime age workers. That is, they're between the ages of 25 and 50. Of course, this is the age group that's most likely to have children and additional responsibilities, and they're making around $10 an hour. Okay. Women and black workers are overrepresented among low wage workers. Uh, those low wage workers are also uh, a large portion of our care workforce. Okay. Uh, economist David Howell at the Washington Center on Equitable Growth has documented the declining quality of jobs in the United States from the 1970s to 2017. That has been particularly hard on young people and young workers, and particularly hard on young workers without a college degree. The share of young workers with no college degree who are in what he defines as a decent job, which is a family sustaining job, fell from 47%, almost half of all non-college degree workers in, 19, uh, in 1979 to just 22% of non-college degree workers in 2017. He finds that 50%, half of all non-college educated men are employed in what he defines as a lousy job. Okay. And he also defines it primarily via wages. Uh, David Howell also finds that since the, or documents that since the 1980s, there has been a large and persistent decoupling of the number of good jobs from GDP growth, or the number of decent jobs, as he says, uh, from GDP growth. So that is, while we've experienced tremendous growth, we've also not experienced uh, the creation of good new jobs. And then, of course, we have David 
um, uh, Daniel Albert of Cornell University who maintains his private sector job quality index um, and it dates back to 1990 and this is an index that comes out monthly and you can see it's it's almost a relentless decline from 1990 there's a little bit of an upswing there around 2015 and then back down again I will say if you go to 2022 it, it is coming back up again a little bit but nowhere near where it was in 1990 I took this snapshot though because it ends in February of 2020 and in February of 2020, the month before everything went crazy, right, everything um, before the pandemic really took hold of our economy, we were at historically low unemployment, 50-year low unemployment, historically low inflation. The stock market was breaking record after record, and the United States in February completed its 128th month of continuous economic growth, a record for the country that you know, was set then of 10 and a half years of uninterrupted economic growth month after month. And at the same time, this is what's happening to our labor market. And again, to come back to Martha Ross's work, we are simultaneously growing millions and millions of low wage workers. So that's a disaster, right? You can plot that other, that other growth you know, trend there against that one. And, and that tells a very sad story. So what happened? How did this happen? How did we enter a period of sustained growth and then that was worse, that, that didn't make things better for most people? That's a big story and I'm not gonna get into that and that's not the focus of our event. But I do think there's three things worth mentioning because there are things that we need to address. Um, first was obviously the loss of millions of good paying union jobs in manufacturing that have just never been replaced, right? And people are still talking about what's happened to those manufacturing jobs and what we're gonna do about it. Um, also, this is the result of decades of relentless focus by corporate America on minimizing labor costs and maximizing shareholder value, okay? Uh, uh, sort of a dogma that has, take, that has taken hold that has led to just constant cost cutting on labor. And then you combine all of that with a, just a lack of strong public policies over the last 20 years to support workers, right? The fail, our failure to raise the federal minimum wage, for example, which still stands at $7.25 an hour, and the lack of resources to enforce labor standards and worker protections and the erosion of worker collective bargaining rights. So this is a, this is a disaster and it's unsustainable and it has to change. And uh, so how do we reverse course, okay? Well, the first thing that we can do is to figure out, you know, come to an agreement about what a good jobs is. So everybody's working on these good jobs groups, uh, ourselves included. Um, and, you know, I think what's really exciting right now is that there's a growing convergence uh, and a growing consensus around what a good job is. And that convergence is around sort of the idea too that it's not just about a wage, that a good job is something we need to think about much more comprehensively and it's something that workers, employers, and government together are all gonna be necessary in order to create. So this particular definition was created by the Good Jobs Champion Group earlier this month and published, uh, and there's a group convened by the Aspen Institute and the Families and Workers Fund. And I think it's a very good definition. Uh, this has been signed on to by hundreds of uh, labor, business, and uh, uh, research, and, and other stakeholders, including ourselves here at New America. But what this really does is sort of really round out everything about a good job. Good jobs are jobs that provide stability, mobility, uh, uh, and voice to workers. They pay family sustaining wages and they include critical benefits such as health care and paid leave. They're accessible to all regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or any other demographic consideration. They create opportunities for career advancement and economic mobility. And workers with good jobs have a voice in their workplace and they are free to organize and advocate for their collective interests. That does not describe the majority of jobs in the United States today. It actually describes a very small share of them. And it's not just the uh, groups outside the government that are interested in defining what a good job is. Now the government has really, and under the Biden administration, has gotten into this too. And they're being very vocal about what they think a good job is and being very vocal about making sure as they put out these federal dollars and making sure that, that the communities where this is going have this definition of, of what a good job is. So again, what's noteworthy about this definition, uh, which is an abbreviated one of what's online, I encourage you to go check it out. But again, there's just, um, there's so much overlap, again, between these two and note the similarities. And also the shared emphasis on worker voice and worker agency as part of the definition of a good job. So a definition is a great thing, um, and it's certainly a start starting point and gives us a North Star, um, and we, it's a good thing to, to have. But now what's next? And what's next really is what we're gonna talk about a little bit more and some of our speakers are gonna talk about, so I don't wanna steal their thunder, but is that there are ways to use the government funding and procurement and purchasing power 
to, connect, to, to, to build a good job strategy. And we're already seeing that in these pieces of legislation, and increasingly we're going to be seeing it in what uh, state and local leaders are doing. Things like uh, the prevailing wage provisions. Uh, this is a, a standard, uh, or, you know, a, a practice in the construction trades that goes back many decades, which requires that uh, workers on a federally funded construction project all make the same wage on that project, right? And this is usually a union negotiated wage, so it's usually a very high wage. So prevailing wage provisions lift up the wages for all workers and creates, uh, create a floor for them, and they really support then good, good employers who then can't be undercut by, uh, not good employers. The administration has extended prevailing wage provisions into their clean energy uh, investments and into the manufacturing sector. And this is a new place outside of just construction. And that is, that is a big development. There are lots of other ones here about making sure increasing the tax credit that a, a potential employer can get if they also agree to train their workers through apprenticeships. Engaging in project labor agreements and local hiring ordinances that say if you take this money, you have to be willing to hire from this, this community, uh, from people who live here, and specifically from people who have faced structural disadvantages or discrimination in getting to these jobs. Really exciting uh, new innovations around how to, how to link uh, infrastructure investments to childcare subsidies. And this is particularly important for women to be able to get into the skilled trades, but also for all workers with children. And also innovative strategies around subsidized employment that allow people who might otherwise really struggle to get into the labor market to do so. So these are all really important. Uh, um, this, was not, this was not part of the conversation five years ago. It wasn't part of the conversation 15 years ago. It's a big change in emphasis about how to use federal infrastructure dollars. And I just want to end now to, here on my last slide, uh, which is uh, to, to talk about some work that we're doing here at New America that we've just kicked off and are undertaking with some wonderful partners, uh, and that's focused on the policies, our policies and systems of workforce development. As I noted earlier, part of what has been happening over the last couple of years is sort of reckoning with the fact that, that a lot of what we thought about our economy hasn't been true. Economic growth does not automatically translate into lifting all boats. It doesn't automatically translate into shared prosperity. Our current public workforce system and the laws that support it are built on a similar set of assumptions about how our labor market works and what are the best ways to help job seekers, which tends to be by trying to get them into a job as quickly as possible, maybe with some training, but the emphasis is on getting folks into jobs. And the problem with that is that unfortunately it puts our workforce development system and the many fantastic practitioners in it who wish that they could do more, it puts them in the position too often of reinforcing pathologies in our labor market, of mapping on to structural inequities and access to good jobs, uh, particularly for black men and women of color. So this seems like a really good time to revisit some of the assumptions that underlie our policies of workforce development and ask ourselves what would it mean to have a workforce development system that is grounded in principles of economic justice, that intentionally advances racial and gender equity in the labor market, and that builds worker voice and power. So we formed a loose group of people and organizations that you can see here on the slide, and we're calling ourselves the Good Jobs Collaborative. And yes, it's not original, but it seems to be working for everyone else. So we are not going to stray from that. And, um, and if you'd like to learn more, if you're uh, part of our online audience, just stick your email in the chat. And we're happy to follow up with you. And anyone who's here, of course, we're happy to chat with you about it. So with that, let's start, uh, let's start hearing from folks who are doing this work out in the field um, and, um, and can share with us just how, what it looks like to actually do this and to, to build a good jobs economy in your community. With that, I'm going to turn, I think some people are going to appear at the door here magically. And I am going to do that. And my wonderful colleague, Lil Tesfai, is going to appear along with the mayor of Rochester, Minnesota, Kim Norton. My name is Lul Tesfai. I'm a senior policy advisor with the Center on Education and Labor here at New America. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Mayor Kim Norton. Um, mayor Norton is the mayor of Rochester, Minnesota. Um, she has held this position since January 2019. And before becoming the city's first female mayor, she had a long history of public service and, and leadership, including 10 years in the Minnesota State Legislature and 10 years on the Rochester Public School Board. 
really excited to be in conversation with you today, Mayor Norton, because I know you, just like so many other uh, city leaders, have been focused on how to advance policies and practices um, that create better jobs for community residents who uh, have really struggled during the pandemic, but, but even before. Um, and, and that's for good reason. We know that um, economic mobility in this country has been declining. Um, stagnant wages and inflation has made it harder for uh, a lot of residents and, and to really just make ends meet, uh, particularly low-income individuals uh, in communities of color. And so I want to hear a little bit from you today about what you're doing um, to make sure that people have access to uh, good jobs and are able to advance economically. But first, could you just tell us a little bit about your city and, and your residents? Sure. So um, I'm the mayor of Rochester, Minnesota, which is in the upper Midwest. Um, we have about 124,000 people in our community, and we host the state's largest employer, which is Mayo Clinic. So we are primarily focused on the world of health care. Um, we have, we're about 73% white. We have an average median income because we're a healthcare community that's actually quite high. It's um, around $76,000 for an individual or $98,000 for a family on average is the medium. I'm sorry, the medium. Um, we have a 6% poverty rate. I've seen it uh, posted as high as 9%, so relatively low poverty. But if you look at our black population in particular, um, what you will find is the average median income is closer to 44,000 and 40% 40 of our black population lives in poverty. So we have great disparities in our community, and we also know that those disparities were exacerbated um, by the pandemic, and that women, and BIPOC women in particular, were the last and are still many of them at home and not back in the workforce. So that was kind of the impetus to, um, for what we've done and what we'll talk about. I would say uh, one other thing that you might want to know about our community is we have something called the Destination Medical Center Initiative which was a $6 billion initiative that Mayo Clinic and private, uh, Mayo Clinic, or, um, it was their idea, I guess, and they got legislative support for $585 million of infrastructure in order to accommodate a $6 billion economic development and growth in our community. So we were already, prior to the pandemic, starting this infrastructure um, replacement and upgrades in our city center uh, and a little beyond that uh, between the two Mayo Clinic campuses, the hospital and the downtown area. So we were already poised to have growth and development in the construction. We, we needed construction workers. We knew that about 2,000, 2,700 a year for the next 10 plus years. And we're also a growing community. Yeah, yes. So Thank you for sharing yeah. that, that background. It was really interesting to hear that you've been thinking about the need to improve your infrastructure. And Mary Alice talked a little bit about some of the federal investments that have been made and, and uh, will flow down to, to cities and, and states to support infrastructure development. So I know it'll be an even bigger priority. Could you talk a little bit about what pathways to infrastructure jobs look like in your community? Well, as I said, we have a great need uh, for those jobs, but what we were finding is that we have, have 16,000 BIPOC women that live in our community, and less than 1% of them were working in this area. And so we, we determined when we had the opportunity to apply for the Global Mayor's Challenge Grant that Bloomberg Philanthropies kind of put out there for mayors to apply, um, we decided that let's focus on the people that were that needed upward mobility that had been impacted the worst during the pandemic and provide them opportunities in an area we knew that we had a need for and that was growing and that provided really good careers. Because when you have a guaranteed investment for 10 or 20 years in your community mm -hmm. because of this Destination Medical Center initiative, that's not a job, that's a career. Mm -hmm. That's 20 years, 10 or, it was a 20 year plan. We're in year 10 right now. So we know that um, we had an opportunity for people and what we did then was spend a year researching, looking at quantitative and qualitative data of, of our community and uh, tried to determine what were the needs, how are we going to get uh, women into that, um, that line of work. Uh, because it did, it, what, we have healthcare, of course, there's a lot of healthcare jobs, and so Mayo Clinic and our community are already working on pathways for healthcare. We have a program called Bridges to Healthcare that's quite uh, successful. And we looked at that program and tried replicating it to an extent, 
but we knew that we didn't have the answers. Why weren't women going into construction and built environment careers? So we brought them to the table. And I think that's really the story um, that's worth telling about the work that we're doing is it wasn't someone in our administration or in the construction industry getting a great idea and telling, say, we're, here's what you need to do. It was bringing women in our community to the table to say, what do you need? What's missing? And we learned a lot in that eight months to a year of investigation, talking to women. We learned a lot. Um, and then they got to be part of the team to devise our plan moving forward. Yeah. And this co-design process that you ended up implementing, it mm -hmm. was something that you had previously used in the city. Could you talk a little bit more about how you had previously used yeah. it and, and how you thought it fitting to apply in a policy context? Absolutely. So we're committed to the democratic process, of course, which involves you know, getting the community, all members of the community, not just those with the loudest voices or um, you know, the most ability to reach us. Um, we decided, uh, in, as a community doing um, this design work on our roads and our, our city center, we decided to use something called co-design. So we um, found members of various communities, um, underrepresented communities, uh, including disability and others at income, various income levels, brought them to the table and did some training, and then sent them back to their communities to talk, had a series of questions, had um, inf information gathering, if you will, and then they would bring that back to the table. So it's an exchange back and forth. It's having a small cohort of individuals who, um, when they did their work, were, were impacting hundreds and hundreds of more individuals that you know, we probably didn't have the time or even place um, to get together to have a, a good discussion. So we had been doing that for our, our road work and our, our plaza design, and we decided to bring it back to the community in a different way in that setting policy. So we brought them to the table on this project and also for our Sustainable and Resiliency Task Force um, and utilize the co-design process there. And um, I did provide, um, we have one booklet which can be passed around here so you can look at it after we've done this work now for the last couple of years. We do have a booklet, but we also have it, um, and I believe you have it online so you can get an electronic copy of, of what we've done and it has some case studies in there um, that talks about the process. But it was absolutely, Fabulous. When we started it, and we brought the women in to talk with our construction workers and an architect and a union laborer and, and others. We brought, it to, we brought them in. It was like dead silence. It was quiet. It was really uncomfortable. By the end of their eight months or so of working together, it was dynamic, and they shared information. And I should also mention, we paid these women to come to the table because you know the men are, get, are already there because they're working and employed and they were getting paid. But we decided we're using them as experts of their own lived experience and helping us design our community. They deserve to be paid too. So we did uh, and have continued to pay these co-designers and kind of ironically but wonderfully, at least three of them that I know of, our current city DEI director, um, uh, one of the, our Destination Medical Center, a new staff member there, and someone in the built environment now were co-designers that got hired um, because people could see the competence. They had the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with them. So it's been really exciting. In fact, one of our young women in the um, built environment uh, called and told us she's just put a down payment on a house for she and her children. So that was really exciting, even before we have really rolled out the whole plan to see our co-designers um, benefiting um, from the experience. I think that's so wonderful and it really speaks to the importance of partnerships which are going to be absolutely critical to make sure that these investments in infrastructure across the country are really benefiting the people who need it absolutely. the most. Um, now, we typically, when we talk about infrastructure, we are referring to roads and bridges, hard infrastructure, but there is an extensive list of other critical forms of infrastructure that are really necessary in communities. And I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about some of those other um, elements of infrastructure that have been really important to your city and your residents. Well, I would say throughout this process of having um, our, our women, our co-designers at the table, is we learned a lot about their needs that maybe, and it is infrastructure, but um, there are needs and barriers, which you know we can talk about with some of the culture clashes. We have a lot of uh, a pretty robust immigrant population in town. They have special needs that aren't being addressed um, by our community, let alone the workforce issues. But childcare, the infrastructure for childcare is just 
absolutely huge for these families. And um, we talked uh, back in the, the green room uh, that we really do need to look at culturally competent and culturally specific childcare for these um, women who want to get into the workforce but really want to make sure that their children are cared for in a, uh, a manner and a, um, a method that is comfortable and familiar to them and their children. And so that's one example of an infrastructure that has to be in place in order for women to get to work and to be able to be successful on their jobs. Flexibility in careers is another that we heard a lot about. Um, sometimes our, our structures are historic and we continue to do them that way because we've always done them that way. And we, we hear from the industries, we need employees, and yet they're not looking at themselves and saying, what might we change? Is it ours or is, it, is there some sort of flexibility that we could put in our role mm -hmm as an employer that would then be more welcoming and convenient to people in order to get new workers um, on the job. And so, uh, you know, we're having to work with those kinds of issues as well. And I don't know if you have others that you're interested in that I... Yeah, well, no, that, you know, that's something that we've heard in conversations with other city mm -hmm. leaders um, and, and community leaders and, and, and workers themselves, just the importance of addressing some of the overall uh, supports and, and need for child care in order mm -hmm. to really be present and, and participate in the, in the uh, workforce. Um, what do you see as the role of cities in supporting those needs that are pretty much universal? It's been interesting because um, what I often hear from people who push back is it's all market driven. Cities shouldn't be involved in business in the market and yet we know that the market has not been successful for everyone and something has to intervene um, to change that that pathway, that historic pathway that has been successful for some but not for everyone. So um, for us, the Global Mayor's Challenge Grant uh, was an opportunity and believe me, it was, a, it was a stretch to think we could compete against you know, mayors and cities all over the world. Um, but we, were, we, were, we felt passionate about the, the work that we were doing and apparently they felt that the work we're doing and who knew the infrastructure bill and the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act would pass when we were working on this because our work now is more relevant than we anticipated because we were looking at it really from a very selfish perspective. We had $585 million of state funds to, to fix our infrastructure, which you know we're all suffering from aging infrastructure mm -hmm. um, across the country. So we were looking at it very selfishly, but now um, we, have, we are laying the groundwork, um, I hope, for a replicable process and procedure that other cities can do um, to see that a city with a little bit of help and support, um, and frankly, if we get this moving, my hope is that the systems will change, whether it be the education systems, the training systems, um, the childcare systems, there's a lot of systems in place, and, and, and the workforce uh, will change in order to accommodate a, a new and important and necessary workforce in the future. So we're laying the groundwork, um, but it isn't, the cities can't do it all. And we do need partners, you mentioned that. Our nonprofits are huge partners. Grants, philanthropy is also something that is gonna have to help us along, I think. Yeah. No, thank you for that, Mayor Norton. I know we have uh, an audience in the room and an audience online. I want to pause to see if there are any questions. A quiet audience. <laughs> thank you. Bridget, if you'd like to... Do you need to repeat it, the question? Yeah, so the, the question was, um, could you talk a little bit more about child care since that was identified as a key barrier to share a little bit more about what um, your team is doing? Yeah, we're just getting started on this part. We spent a year doing the work. Um, then the grant, you know, the winners were announced and we were one of three in the country um, and we're thrilled. And now we're, we're hiring and laying the groundwork to move ahead. Um, one of the things that, 
not just in child care, but also beyond that, that's really important to me, is not just getting people in a, in a job in the built environment, that's important, yes, but it's getting those same women able to be entrepreneurs and open their own businesses, right? So we're, we're starting with one, and, I'm, and, I'm, and that's what the grant was for. We also won $750,000 in federal earmarks for this project, which I hope we can you know, layer on the top of that for these entrepreneur jobs. And frankly, daycare is an entrepreneur job, particularly if we're talking you know, culturally sensitive, culturally specific daycare. Um, and then the National League of Cities, an organization that most cities belong to, um, has a couple programs, uh, communities of cities of opportunity, of which we're involved in, and uh, inclusive entrepreneurship. And so we're having a child, we're, we're doing um, informal entrepreneurship track, um, an ecosystem accelerator track, and we didn't get into the early childhood track, but we're going to mirror it and do it anyway, because we feel it is so important, um, and, we, and I'm not sure how exactly we're still working with National League of Cities to, to make it work, and they're committed to helping us. because. We have to build on the grant. It's not the grant itself that's going to solve all the problems. We have to build on that to build this entrepreneurship network in. So that's kind of how we're looking at it as, entrepreneur, as, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, as we move ahead. And I, I would just mention um, a couple other things just that, that we learned in that, that phase of, of meeting with and talking with our community and through that co-design process. Um, women prefer to work in cohorts. They don't want to be the only one on the work site. It's very uncomfortable. If there's a problem on the work site, they don't want to be the one raising their hand and saying there's a problem because it might affect their ability to keep and maintain that job. So uh, one of the things that we're providing um, is navigators on site, both for the business as well as for the women. So as we move through this pilot project, or it's not going to be more than a pilot, but as we move through the project, the starting phase, we'll have navigators for the women that can be on the work site and help be their voice, and we're making, we're not making, our businesses have agreed to go through um, a diversity um, assessment prior to bringing the women on, and they're going to have a navigator, and the two of those navigators will work together, you know, paying attention to the needs of each of their group that they represent, and coming to solutions that are workable for both. So um, that's another component I thought might be worth mentioning. And, Another one was um, the familial influence. When, when we have a, a pretty robust group of immigrant families in our town with cultural barriers um, that, I, that I wasn't aware of. It's like, you have to go into this type of field. It has to be a helping, caring field. And we need to find ways to not just, if the individual, the, the young lady I spoke with was telling me, well, I may want to do that, but if it isn't acceptable or my family doesn't understand that job or think it's appropriate for me or a woman, they're not going to pay for it, right? So we're going to remove that barrier um, of cost. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have to know we have to work with the families. It's not just that student or that young woman. It's working with that woman and her whole family um, throughout the process. So those are just a couple other examples of things, of these barriers that I don't think some of the traditional methods being used right now are necessarily addressing that came out in our, our uh, analysis. Wow, that's great feedback to receive. Yeah. I know we have another question. Hi, my name's Amy Cardell. I'm with CompTIA, the Computer Trade Industry Association. And Mayor Norton, I really appreciate your co-design approach. It was very interesting for us to hear those insights. And I think many of them affect so many of the jobs in the tech sector that we're looking at. I was curious as well about the co-design of the community or your research that showed what sectors the jobs will be in, because obviously you talked about construction and you're a healthcare hub, but you know my secret evil plan is, of course, technology jobs. So I'd love to hear what you found there too. Well, my community, as I mentioned before, is definitely healthcare focused. Um, we also are, have been uh, home to the largest IBM manufacturing plant, um, which has now changed over time, so it's not manufacturing any longer. Um, so we have a lot of technology workers in town, and, and we're, we're trying to work that in. I guess I would say um, we've just had an analysis done of the needs of our city um, and also are looking at what jobs are going to be out, not outsourced, um, work from home in the future. And so we're trying to, to look at our city center, all the money we're spending on building that out and saying, do we need to make changes based on what we're learning during the pandemic? And, 
and thinking about the future of city centers. And so we know we're going to need more than just construction workers, and, and that, that is the area that we're focused on. But we think the co-design method can be used in other areas as well. And we think just like we used it for physical infrastructure, now we're using it for um, policy infrastructure for our communities. And I think it can, I think it can be replicated um, into any industry, frankly. Um, but it is purposeful. It takes time. Um, and you have to, I think, if you're going to, this is the, the message we heard. We get asked time and time again, this was our community, our women saying, we get asked time and time again for our opinion, and then we, nothing happens, right? So people don't want to be asked, and then <coughs> nothing happens. So again, they are part of the design team, not just a, we want your opinion and then goodbye, right? I think that's part of what makes this so important, but I think it can be transferred, and, and I hope people will, will try it. And as I said, we just put together the framework in this booklet, um, or online booklet. Um, so I don't really have a, a hard answer yet because we're just at the beginning, but I do think it's transferable. But it's really helpful to hear kind of your initial thinking even early on in this process. Mm -hmm. I know we have another question. Yeah. Norton, thanks so much for being here. Uh, Shailen Jotishi from New America. Um, my question is about uh, how we can go about funding these kinds of efforts at other cities. You know, it's, it's really great that, you know, your community won the grant and you mentioned partnerships with nonprofits and philanthropies. But you also mentioned, you know, employers and getting them to look inward and think about what they can do. And I'm curious if you have advice for mayors and city leaders and other communities and regions who might not have the foundations or the philanthropies, but do have employers as partners. Have you seen anything that works well to incentivize employer financial contributions to these kinds of uh, efforts on co-design and sort of how do you fund that as a city leader and as a mayor? Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. I would say we were fortunate in that we had the Destination Medical Center initiative out there, which did give us money not for some for people, but mostly for the infrastructure. So, uh, and we had a model in place uh, to do that. So, um, I would say the other piece, and we talked about this in the back room, is that at the start of the pandemic, we needed to make sure everyone was taken care of in our community. So we met as, uh, as part of our nonprofit consortium. The city jumped in, the county jumped in, and the chamber, frankly, came to those meetings as well, the Chamber of Commerce. And we, we met every other week um, with all the nonprofits in our community online. And that, that continued throughout the whole pandemic. And what was fascinating, and it, it, it wasn't so much about an infrastructure change, the, that this may come to bear, but I think this idea of building that really strong partnership with all of our, it wasn't every one of them, but we would have 60 or 70 or 80 people um, from time to time that major, we have a lot of nonprofits in town, but the major nonprofits would come and we could talk to each other about where we saw a hole. Who's going to help this group? Or we've identified this problem. Does anyone out there have the capacity to address it? And so on these regular meetings, these regular calls, we were able to say, and someone would say, yeah, I, I can help feed that group, or I can help provide housing, or get a job, or, you know. So because we were all working together, I would say the challenge has been keeping that going post-pandemic. Um, we do meet monthly, but I think it's trickled off a little bit, and I think, um, you know, here, moving ahead into the next year, we need to make sure that that stays strong. We were fortunate that during the pandemic we had that, um, and we need to continue to do it. And I do think um, we have, of course, Mayo Clinic is a major employer. Well, they know that having a strong community and a strong economy helps them, right? Other businesses know that too. And we were so fortunate. We had um, a couple, an architect, we had a construction company, we had the unions who identified their own needs and said, we're going to come to the table and help you because it helps us too, right? So I think, yes, I think absolutely getting businesses on board because it's helping them. If we, if, we have a, if we have a project and there's nobody that can provide the work, we're, you know, they're in trouble, we're in trouble. Yeah. 
So it, it takes us all. Yeah, really, really identifying the, the common needs that you all have to identify some common solutions together. I think that's and, incredible. And we've done that in healthcare in our community in the past, of course, because mm -hmm. of Mayo Clinic. Um, the Bridges to Healthcare program has been highly successful. They target um, new immigrants and refugees who come to town, help with language training, get them through um, training. And again, they provide one-on-one -on -one supports. So if you're struggling in school, there's always someone right there who knows. And we're going to be doing that as well as we get people into the training, whether it be a, a union training or whether it be um, RCTC or community college, or if they want to be an architect and go to a four-year university, because we know we need architects too, mm -hmm. um, there will be someone there that will be there to, to help support them if they need it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. Hi, Ooh, hello. Um, I have just a quick question. I actually builds on the end of your response there. I'm, I'm wondering how much of this work is being targeted um, to young adults, and in, in, in particular, getting young adults into some of these fields that you've mentioned in infrastructure. Here at New America, we lead a, a national working group on um, youth apprenticeship and work-based learning in the skilled trades, and we hear from our from some folks who are Minnesota-based and from other. Um, uh, partners around the country that it can be very difficult to recruit young people into these roles, both because they may not necessarily know about them or know how to access them, but there are also regulations um, and sort of insurance barriers to hiring younger people before they graduate from high school. So I'd love to hear um, any strategies that you all have used to try to target younger learners, whether it's specifically through this infrastructure activity, um, or you mentioned earlier in your remarks, just trying to reduce cost barriers and access barriers to post-secondary training generally for, for young adults. Yes, all of that. <laughs> uh, we did learn in the interview process um, early on um, about, we did interviews, and, and I, I actually have the sheet here, the questions we asked people. Most people had not even heard the names of probably two-thirds, three-quarters of the trades and the jobs in the industry. They didn't know what they were. I said, well, how can I, you know, how can anyone aspire to something where they don't even know what the term means? It, it's not a job. They don't even know what it is. So we identified that early on. So it's, so we're looking at it at several levels, um, the industry level and getting people in that may have gone through the training because we had been trying to do a little training before. Um, but working through the K-12 system um, with a, a career awareness, um, some hands-on experiences. We do have a program, uh, a CTEC program in our community, so our high school students can come out and do some technical careers, um, some training, and some of those are like welding some of the skills that we need in the community. So we have that for high school and we need to grow that. Um, and also outside of the school setting, and that's an area that's really fascinating. The Girl Scouts in the, in the state of Minnesota do a wonderful, I went this summer, was up in the Twin Cities, it's called Power Girls. And so it's a week long camp where they stay up in the Twin Cities and it was for Southern Minnesota. Um, so I went up and experienced it, and there was a day on electricity, and there was a day on carpentry, and there was a day, and each day was a different trade, and the girls spent the entire day building something, computer cables that they could take home and use, you know, for their computer and Ethernet cables. And I mean, so it was hands-on. What, what we learned, however, and again, the best idea, right, but nobody bothered to ask some of the families, mm -hmm. what we found out in a, in a a different setting in our community is that for many families, particularly immigrant families, overnights aren't a thing. They don't do overnights, not to their neighbors, not to their friends, and certainly not to a camp up in the Twin Cities. And so the camp was primarily um, for white children, not 100%, but you know, and that's, that's great because we want all women in construction, so that's fine, but how are we reaching our, our BIPOC community? We're not. So we are actually going to work with the Girl Scouts this summer in Rochester at a day camp that will be similar, but it will be a day camp for kids in the region who can come in and experience the same thing and go home at night. So we can remove that barrier of overnights that literally none of us were aware it was a thing. So it's, it's that kind of learning. And again, if you bring people with lived experience and bring people from different cultures to the table, they can tell you that and you don't have to wait 10 years to find out. You know, that the kids in the class that didn't come to my daughter's overnight for her birthday were because it's, not, it's culturally uncomfortable, and I didn't know that, right? Mm -hmm. I have um, 
One, one final question for you, and this has sure. been such a, a really great discussion, um, but our conversation is going to be followed by a uh, discussion um, between um, the Deputy Secretary of Labor, Deputy Secretary of Transportation. We will also hear from uh, someone from the Department of Commerce, um, three agencies that are a part of the broader federal effort to make sure that these historic investments in infrastructure um, projects are also leading to really wonderful infrastructure jobs for communities, particularly marginalized communities. Um, and so I'd love to hear from you your reflections on the role that the federal government should play, but also state governments in, in making sure that we are effectively leveraging these, these resources that we can expect over the next several years. It really is an exciting time. Um, we're working on this, and, and as I said, kind of surprise, infrastructure, <laughs> and um, it, it, there's money available for all of us, and I'm busy trying to get infrastructure dollars into my communities, you know, which means more of a workforce. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it's just absolutely vital that we do this, and it's, it's not just vital that we have an influx of money for uh, infrastructure or for electrification or for you know energy that energy transition yes that's all wonderful but this is an opportunity to make sure that every single person in your community gets to benefit from that and not the same people that have always historically benefited we but we have to do the work mm -hmm. in the cities and in our communities and in our jobs and in our nonprofits to make sure that we can provide that upward mobility to everybody in this country mm -hmm. We haven't had this kind of opportunity that I'm aware of for a long, long time, um, maybe ever. Um, so my hope is that the work that we're doing can be replicable, that other communities can be, you know, see it as a model that they might want to do in order to take advantage of the wonderful infrastructure that is so vital at a time when our country's infrastructure is aging, yeah. right? And we all are going to need to do that work, and this will allow us to do it and let everybody in our community benefit. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Are there existing structures within your state that you're tapping into or that could be you know, leveraged to really facilitate the sort of coordination that's necessary, not just at the city level, but at the regional level and then across the state? We're building those out. We've started having meetings with some of the, um, for instance, our state union boards. Um, after, the, after we were identified as one of the you know, 15 Global Mayors Challenge cities, we made those calls and we've had some of those initial meetings to say, how can we all work together and make this not just about Rochester, but, but changing the way we do things to benefit people all over. And I would say there have been efforts underway. Um, and, and the one point that I made is, well, if less than 1% of the construction workers in my community are, are BIPOC women, then we've got a lot more work to do. So it's not to say that anybody wasn't, that the best efforts and intents weren't there, but it wasn't working. And so we're hoping that through our efforts and the, the co-design model, mm -hmm. that we can start making sure that the efforts that people are making pay off for the people that we're trying to provide upward mobility to at this extraordinary time in our history. Thank you, Mayor Norton. Please Absolutely. join me in thanking Mayor Norton. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be here, and we are super lucky to have these really dynamic uh, administration officials, who I'm just going to call Julie and Polly because you have long handles, so I hope that's okay. Um, so, yeah. This is a really interesting time, obviously, in economic development, um, because a, a few industries in particular are being supercharged with a lot of federal investment. And there is an appropriate focus, as Mary Alice outlined, on making sure those jobs are decent. And um, you know, in the past, there has been a focus in federal contracting on the lowest bid wins, because that's an efficient way to spend our government dollars. And I think changing that paradigm is, um, is a real challenge, and I think it's a sort of generational commitment um, that's been underway for many years. So um, I first just thought I would start out broad and ask you guys, since your roles are different, um, how do you see your role in this larger project of trying to make sure jobs in general or specifically those supported by federal dollars are family sustaining, with, you know, infused with worker power, well paid, have with long term retirement security, all the things we've talked about. Maybe I'll let the MacArthur genius okay. uh, kick <laughs> us off here. <laughs> hang on her every word. 
now Polly can make fun of me because we've been working together um, closely <laughs> since we came into this administration together. Um, but thank you so much for the question. Thank you for having me. It's so good to be here um, with my friends at New America and also um, Deputy Secretary Trottenberg. And I, so uh, let me say a couple of things. One is that, you know, we keep talking about this like unprecedented level of federal investment. Um, and just to really like hit home what we're talking about, um, the amount of investment that we are currently making in infrastructure, just in you know, roads and bridges and highways, is more than uh, what was invested in uh, during the Eisenhower administration when the national highway system was built. Um, the amount that we are investing in innovation, right, in, uh, through like chips uh, and science, is more than the investments that were made during President Kennedy's administration when we sent a man to the moon. And the amount that we're investing now in just you know, climate, there's really no comparison to any prior administration. So it really is uh, an incredible time, I think an incredibly exciting time, to think about how federal investment can really shape private, uh, you, know, uh, you know, other local city, state, um, and community uh, opportunities. Um, for us at the Department of Labor, um, you know, we really see ourselves as partners to those, to our sister agencies who are charged with putting out that funding, um, and specifically on a couple of fronts. One is on what's already been talked about today is job quality, right? This is a moment in which, um, I mean, it's the right thing to do at any time, but, you know, and it's the right thing to do sort of by the things that, that, that you mentioned, right? Sometimes, you know, history tells us the lowest bid is not always the, in the long run, the lowest cost, right? It's not always the best investment. And so really thinking about how good jobs are part of building this future that we want is, you know, I think this is an opportunity for that. It's also a moment in which workers are, you know, we've seen a, a shift in how workers, uh, in worker power, right? We've seen, um, you know, people talk about the great, great resignation, but the reality is that more people have been, there have been more hires than there have been resignations yeah, in the last couple of years, which means that people are really leaving bad jobs for better jobs um, and leaving better jobs for even better jobs. So this is a moment which workers are you know, really demanding their seat at the table. They're organizing in unprecedented ways. And so job quality becomes a greater imperative because of that. So we view our role as helping to support our sister agencies in um, having good job standards attached to federal funding. Again, recognize that federal funding can really drive behavior. Um, that's why our secretary, Secretary Walsh, launched the Good Jobs Initiative, which has MOUs with various agencies. We can talk about that a little bit more today. But the other piece is our work to make sure that these good jobs that are created um, are distributed in a way that advances equity, equitable outcomes, that includes communities that have been for so long excluded, even in the best of times. And so um, really looking at um, how we you know, use this moment um, not just to advance policy goals, not just to create good jobs, but to really combat systemic racism and other forms of exclusion. Um, because a lot of these jobs that are being created have not been equitably um, available to all communities. So really thinking about how we do that in, in a sustained way is very exciting for us. Well, let me just follow on, and, and, and Mary Alice, New America, thanks for having us here today. It's great to be here with, uh, with my colleague Julie and, and Lydia from the New York Times. Thank you. Thanks to all the journalists who are doing amazing work in these challenging political times. Um, I think just to underscore a bit of what Julie's talking about, and particularly I'll speak about it from the transportation context, I think, you know, as a sector, transportation is one of the most highly unionized and comes sort of comes to the table even before the big infrastructure bill with some statutory labor protections, including a couple that are very well known, Prevailing Wage and Davis-Bacon, which you know, already set sort of a foundational stage in, in terms of wages and working closely with the unionized sector in transit. So you know, we start off luckily in a place where we have a lot of good jobs, and the infrastructure bill has given us the opportunity to expand you know, sort of the transportation workforce, both internally at USDOT for starters, and then obviously in transportation agencies all over the country, as well as in private construction firms, et cetera. You know, our focus has particularly been, as this extraordinary set of opportunities arises, exactly what Julie is talking about. How do we make sure that we don't miss this moment to get to all the communities that have not been well served in transportation in terms of employment opportunities, training opportunities, and also on the procurement side, you know, procurement and wealth building opportunities. And that's where I think our partnership um, 
with DOL and our two secretaries, Buttigieg and Walsh, but also particularly Julie, because she has been such a leader in this field for so many years of thinking through, we've got the money. We have, at least on the transportation side, a strong statutory framework. But how do we now sort of overcome you know, generations of barriers to women, to people of color, from getting into those high paid jobs, those union jobs? And it has been, I think, one of the most exciting parts of our partnership to really dig in on that question and tackle it in a real kind of multi-dimensional way from looking at pre-apprentice training to looking at how the hiring is happening to looking at all the ways that we can in within our statutory authorities use our grant making process to nudge along more diverse workforces local hiring a lot of the practices that we think will move the needle and and I would just say one thing um, Lydia, I think the good news is, and look, I, I, on the New York City side, was involved in a lot of procurements and this question about lowest bid and value for money. And I think there is now a growing transition into recognizing that really good project delivery is about a lot of different value propositions, including what you do to train your local workforce. So I, I'm encouraged that that, I think, is now starting to become, and we're seeing that in places all over the country and not just sort of, you know, oh, the big cities of California but places you might not expect it, a recognition, particularly with this level of transformative funding, we got to do more in the end than just get a bunch of projects at the lowest possible cost. We want to lift up communities and bring a whole new generation of diverse workers into the transportation field. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good to have a concrete conversation about what this actually looks like. And I'm sure there's lots of local government officials listening and wondering, you know, how do I craft these proposals and everything. So tell me more. Um, from both of your guys' ends of this, what it actually looks like. Are you doing requirements? Is it um, just sort of nudges? Is it like a suggestion that maybe we'll look upon this favorably? Um, is it a point system? How are these principles being infused into the leverage of federal dollars? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack. Yeah. And then, and mm -hmm. it, it varies a lot from program to program. Um, you know, both the statutory requirements the let you know sort of the legislative history and, and how we do this but I'll give a couple of very affirmative um, examples that I think are exciting uh, we have a program at our Federal Transit Administration which is called low and no emissions program and it's to give grants particularly now we're really focused on converting the nation's bus fleet from diesel to electric it's going to have huge environmental benefits but as part of that program, the grant recipients are allowed to take a proportion of those funds and use them to work with their workforce to train them in these new type of vehicles. And that's something we're partnering with DOL on. So there, it's a very affirmative statutory part of the program with dollars set aside. We have another program, which is for um, rail grants. The program's called CRISI. And there, we are allowed to give affirmative grants for workforce development. We just gave an $8 million grant to Amtrak to work on a whole new training and apprenticeship program for rail workers. In our other programs, it very much runs the gamut. But in a lot of the discretionary grant programs, we've been able to put in language where essentially we're talking about, you know, again, training, project labor agreements, a bunch of good labor practices, um, both to grow and diversify the workforce and to ensure that they have appropriate labor protections. And we can look at that as a way to sort of give them extra you know, basically extra credit in the grant applications. And, and I'm happy to say, look, we're sort of the first year in on doing some of these grant programs with some of that language. And I, I think we got a great response. We probably have seen, you know, whereas in previous years we might have just a handful of grantees that had written in talking about what they were going to do on the labor front, we're now seeing probably close to a third doing that. And I think in coming years we're going to see a lot more. So we're really excited. Um, about the progress there. It's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a learning experience for all of us. But, you know, and again, I think we've seen, and I know Julie can talk about this, you know, what's been exciting is we've seen examples of communities in really diverse places. Louisville, Kentucky is doing an incredible project working with their local community. So, you know, not just in the, the places you might expect to see it. Yeah. Well, I'll just build on that, Polly, because I, I always cite to your point that um, in including language in your you know, notices of funding opportunities, you have seen some shift in, uh, in the applications that you get. And again, that is the power of leveraging federal investments to um, reflect the values of this administration, right? And this president has been very, very clear that building an economy that's centered on the well-being of workers, that is about expanding good union jobs, is, is very much how we build a, you know, how we build back and how we, um, uh, you know, 
create a, a, not just a strong recovered economy, but a, but a resilient one. Um, I think the other thing I'll just add to that is the, the other thing that we've done in addition to um, working with Polly and our other, um, uh, you know, other, other departments um, putting out federal funding in terms of what kind of language can be included in grants is really trying to give concrete examples of what this really looks like on the ground. Right? The other good news, in addition to everything that Polly said, which I agree with, is that we don't have to invent a lot of this stuff out of whole cloth. Like, there are examples of what we're talking about, right? sector-based labor management partnerships with true worker voice that's focused on reaching out to communities that would not otherwise get the jobs, much less get into the training programs. There's examples of that, and we have an opportunity now. You know, we, we don't need to do it all at the federal government level, right? We should you know, reward, incentivize that kind of uh, good work that's happened on the ground. So as another example of a you know, place that people might not expect, um, you know, there's been really good work um, done by Jobs to Move America, along with a company called New Flyer, where they basically uh, entered into a community benefits agreement to make sure to hire folks from the local community to build electric buses. I mean, so how do we, uh, you know, kind of reward and incentivize that kind of behavior so that it's scaled across the entire economy is really exciting. So presenting specific examples of, of things that are working, connecting people so that, you know, they can learn from one another is something we've spent a lot of time doing. We did a good job summit, which Polly, you know, um, very kindly came to speak at, where we brought together folks working on the ground at cities, in states, right, between unions and employers, um, and, you know, and, and, and uh, intermediaries and, and sector leaders to talk about what they're doing. And I think sharing those kinds of examples is a key part of, um, of how we get where we want to be. So I hear a lot of reward, incentivize, showcase, um, provide extra grants if you do this thing, like, but not a lot of requiring, mandating, you know, et cetera. And I'm wondering if there's a hesitation to do that, if there's a trade-off between getting procurement contracts out the door um, in a timely fashion and making sure that all these good things are part of them. Well, I just think, I think you have to look at carefully for, for each agency at what we're allowed to do statutorily. I mean, that's usually the limiting factor here. And again, as I sort of said at the outset, you know, we have a couple of long-standing statutory tools in the transportation sector. I mean, we have prevailing wage. If you're using federal dollars on a project, you have to pay a prevailing wage, which is, you know, typically a very good wage in terms of raising a family and, and having a middle-class lifestyle. Ditto. Um, Davis-Bacon, ditto, another provision we have, 13C, which affects how we work with Department of Labor on, uh, w with transit workers. So those are very strong statutory foundations. Beyond that, I think you have to be, again, as a federal agency, use every tool in your disposal, but you have to be somewhat careful about exceeding your statutory mandate. And I think, you know, one thing some of your audience may have seen, something we're very you know, we're, we're proud of, but it's proved controversial is our, our Federal Highway Administration put out actually an internal memo talking about what particularly was the vision for formula dollars, where we as an agency have sort of far less discretion. Talking about the workforce pieces, climate pieces, you name it, and it's, it's proved controversial. You know, with real pushback on Capitol Hill, you know, accusing us of potentially overstepping our statutory, uh, you know, authority. So I think you have to find that sweet spot, and I, I think one thing I think we're proud of being in this administration, I think we've leaned in really hard wherever we can to try and really make the case and set up a, you know, a structure that's going to incentivize what we're all talking about here today, which is you know, a diverse, well-trained workforce that's working on these infrastructure projects and, and hopefully you know, starting a whole new set of career paths for folks. As well as, again, I want to just hit up also on the procurement side doing a lot to up our DBE goals and making sure that women-owned and minority-owned firms really get a piece of the contracting work and can create that generational wealth. So I would say I think we, we, we push as far as we can given our statutory authorities, but Congress also obviously has a say in how these programs are designed and implemented. Mm -hmm. Anything to add on that, Julie? No, I mean, I think that's right. You know, for us at the Department of Labor, we, um, we didn't get any of the funding in terms of, you know, the, 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 these bills, and so our work has really been in support. I think you know, Polly's absolutely right that there are places where um, there are statutory requirements like prevailing wage, which we think are very, very important and really invaluable. And then there's other places where um, you know the, the the nudge, the incentivize, um, and then like I said, there's the even soft like you know, how do we demonstrate what is possible and demonstrate that it's actually really good in communities, so that even where it's voluntary, more more folks are likely to do it. Right? I think it's 
clear that people are not going to be able to enjoy the safe roads and new bridges and you know infrastructure in this administration is broader than roads and bridges, right? The, 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 the broadband and the clean water flowing from your pipes if you don't have the economic security that comes with a good job. And so recognizing that that is ultimately what's best for, you know, to make the investments go as far as they can, you know, we're, we're hopeful that um, if we show how it can be done, that there will be more, that, you know, that it'll be done at scale mm -hmm. and it'll be, uh, looking back like 10 years from now, we will say that, you know, um, it didn't happen just because we required it, but it did happen because it was the right thing to do and we made it easy to do. Yeah. So, I mean, oh, um, well taken that there are statutory limits and that Davis-Bacon um, and the Service Contract Act are super powerful and have made these jobs better jobs over the years. And, and not to... And, and make the transportation sector the, one of the most unionized sectors in the economy. I mean, we start off from a, a place where, you know, more to do, but where transportation jobs are pretty traditionally unionized and therefore good wages, good benefits, you know, good lifelong training. Right. I, well, let me do a slight tangent question before I get into the real other question. But um, those statutes do tend to, um, in my experience, um, fall apart a little bit on when it, things get to like contracting and subcontracting and enforcement and making sure that everybody truly is um, enjoying the benefits of those laws. Um, or sometimes it, they don't totally extend to like concessionaires, you know, folks who work at the Pentagon and at the McDonald's inside. Um, so are, are you doing something you can to make sure that even those laws benefit as many people so whose wages are ultimately paid by federal tax dollars as you can? Well, I think you're, you're sort of getting into a bigger question here and one that I think is a really good one and is increasingly, I think, becoming a campaign. I know Unite Now and, and, and other unions around the country have been looking at, you know, one place they've been looking that we've been working with them on is what's happening at airports, which is exactly that question, which is a lot of airports get a lot of federal grants, um, you know, typically, you know, there'll be an airport operator that is maybe a public authority, maybe a private authority, and then is contracting out a certain amount of airport, uh, you know, a certain amount of airport concessions and other things, and looking at the potential nexus there. You know, again, you, ha you have to look a bit, at least for DOT, at the, you know, sort of our statutory authorities. Um, you know, where an entity is a direct recipient of federal dollars, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of strings we can pull where, um, you know, they're using their dollars for one thing and then they have contracting in another area. It, there's not always the same nexus, but listen, I think we, we intellectually, we totally get where those campaigns are coming from and we want to see if there are ways that we can make progress there. I mean, I think ideally when an entity or an ecosystem is getting a lot of federal dollars, we should figure out a way, make sure that all the jobs that are involved there, um, you know, are getting the right, you know, the right set of wages, benefits, et cetera. But, you know, statutorily, the further removed the dollars sort of get from what an agency is directly given out, the less you have necessarily potentially in, uh, you know, the kind of hooks that you have when the dollars are direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just such an important point, and so I just want to thank you for raising it. You know, I think as much as we um, celebrate the historic investments and the good things that are being done, it's important to take a really clear-eyed view about the you know, very real struggles of working people across our economy, and part of it due to the things that you've talked about, right? Subcontracting, which for decades has been used as a way to insulate those at the top of the chain from responsibility for workers at the end of that chain. Now, you know, this president has taken steps to try to address that too, right? Through executive orders, um, you know, $15 minimum wage across the entire, you know, um, uh, for all, all federal contractors. Um, you know, misclassification is another big one, right, which is a part of this, where for a very long time, not just individual employers, but whole industries have made it a business model to basically skirt a century of labor laws by calling people who should be employees independent contractors. And so we have just um, uh, issued um, a proposed rule to try to reverse the last administration's weakening of, uh, of, of, of um, rules about independent contracting. Um, and, you know, then that requires enforcement. So it's just a really, it's just an important reminder of the, of, of the many challenges um, in the workplace and the importance of a whole bunch of different pieces, right? Besides, you know, just the, the sort of federal investments, we need 
we, we need strong labor laws. We need enforcement of those labor laws. And we need to, you know, we, we, you know it's, we, we have a president who's been very clear that workers organizing and, and the freedom to organize is a really, really important part of that equation. You're not going to make a pitch for extra appropriations to get this all done. That was like a wide open. Um, I can't <laughs> remember what I'm allowed to do, so I'm not going to okay. do that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, well, this might, okay, just at the risk of asking you to do something else you're not allowed to do. Um, so, I mean, we've established there's limitations on what you can do. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know, like, what would be the obvious statutory changes to allow you to make these dollars work harder for people? I mean, I, I, I want to, and I think Julie will have a lot of thoughts on that. I'll, I'll just give sort of one thought. I mean, we do speak about the big infrastructure pillar. It was the bipartisan infrastructure law. And look, I'm, I'm super proud to be part of an administration. I say this about President Biden. He was a legislator. And if you look at what we have accomplished legislatively in the past year and a half, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, we have done a, you know, a fantastic list of legislative accomplishments, and some of them bipartisan, which he's proud of. So I think, you know, I can answer that question, but I also want to say, you know, he is, a, he, is a, he is a president who is very much grounded in, you know, sort of working with the Congress and getting the best we can. So I think, you know, politically, just to hit on something Julie said, I think one thing that we're finding exciting here is that what we're doing on the ground, I think, is sort of opening up minds and, and winning over some hearts. And, you know, I, I have no doubt that our administration will probably be back again with Congress next year trying to perhaps gain more ground on some of these issues. But I want to be careful. I don't know that I want to say exactly what the agenda would be. But I do think, I know this president and our administration were fiercely committed to continuing to make advancements on this. And we'll see what the legislative landscape looks like next year. But I, I have a hunch, and I'm sure Julie has some thoughts on this. You know, we will be coming back over and over again legislatively. Well, I'm going to shift a little bit, and then please correct me if, if I should answer the question more directly. But one of the things that um, I say a lot inside the Department of Labor is, what are we doing to unleash our full power? Um, the full power we've already been given, right? The full power that we've been given legislatively, um, budgetarily, um, and, 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 through other, and through other rules, right? I think Oftentimes in government, there's a sense that we have to have new things in order to do more. And while there, that is certainly true, and I agree again with everything that Polly said, there's also a tremendous amount of work that can be done within government agencies to just unleash the full power that we've already been given. So as an example, right, part of the whole conversation around workforce is around the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, or WIOA, right, which is, you know, billions of dollars. Uh, you know, much of it in formula grants to states ar around building a workforce, right? Trying to answer this question that is all around us, right? How do we make sure we have the workers to do the things that we want to do? And again, our answer is you make them good jobs and you focus on equity and you make, you know, make sure that you are tapping to the full talent of the American workforce. But part of that is also making sure that there's innovation and bold innovation going on within the workforce world. So we've been really, you know, you know, like leaning into how do we make sure that WIOA is utilized in the full creative way that it can be used to support some of these we're talking about, sector-based labor management partnerships with job quality and equity at their center. Um, and so we, we, we have launched a, a campaign that's called Yes, WIOA Can that is meant to make it clear to um, everyone in the WIOA world that there's lots of myths and restrictions that have come up around WIOA that are, that are myths. And how do we break those down so that we are, again, utilizing the resources that are already there? I love uh, weird acronym puns. That's <laughs> great. Um, so, um, well, so uh, we, the, the previous discussion with um, Mayor Norton talked a lot about the importance of care uh, and care jobs, care as an enabler of people doing jobs, um, you know, the build back original Build Back Better plan had a lot of money for that. That was not, did not make it into final version. Um, I know that these are not people you employ, Secretary, <laughs> Deputy Secretary Tratt Trattenberg, but I'm just wondering to both of you, like, um, do you think the current flight of federal investments can be kind of leveraged to try to lift up those professions as well, um, even though right now they directly pay for hard infrastructure? Right. Well, so I, you know, I think I can say this on behalf of the entire administration, right? Um, you know, President Biden, Vice President Harris, 
we're very clear that care is infrastructure and that, you know, as, as you said, as you know, my friend Ai-jin Poo at the National Domestic Workers Alliance says all the time, it is the, the work that makes all of the work possible. And so the, you know, the, the, the ambitions in Build Back Better around making sure that we truly invest that infrastructure the same way we invest in other infrastructure uh, was really broad. And unfortunately, um, uh, you know, Congress didn't pass it. Um, so you know, for us, that has meant that we have shifted to try to find other ways of utilizing powers that we have to make sure that there is an investment in care workers, that we, you know, as we look at who's getting jobs, like this whole conversation about, you know, making sure that there are um, women, people of color in these good jobs that we're making does require some amount of making sure that there's a care infrastructure so that people can go to work, right? And that's partly why in all these workforce um, d development, you know, uh, uh, you know, training partnerships that we care about. We're also interested in, in investments in support um, systems, right? F funding for things like care, like um, transportation and, you know, uh, tools, other things that, that, you know, are sort of work adjacent things that, that, that make work possible. And so we are, we've been trying to really look at ways to do that. Um, we are utilizing, you know, and encouraging um, investments of WIOA dollars and others into care, um, uh, care training programs that will both, again, make sure that we meet the need for care and elevate those care jobs. Um, and so there's, you know, frankly, just a lot more work that needs to be done there. And we are, um, you know, we're, we're deeply aware of it and looking at creative ways to, um, certainly one of the other things is, you know, coming from California and seeing what local and state entities are doing in creative ways to lean into the need for a strong air care infrastructure. I think there's also, again, you know, we don't believe that the federal government should do it all, need to do it all, or, sh or you know, or, or can do it all. And so figuring out how we support creative work on the local level um, in, in this space is also something that's exciting for us. Got it. You know, like daycare centers on, you know, job sites, maybe, I'm just thinking creatively. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to take questions soon so people start thinking. Um, but in the meantime, to give you a chance to think about it 10 minutes, okay. Um, so, you know, there's, as we've talked about, a ton of dollars coming through the pipeline. Um, but if I'm an 18 year old and I'm like answering the call to go build bridges and bike lanes, et cetera, um, what confidence could you give me that these jobs will be around after this cycle of investments, like that they will be sustained, that the, we will be entering a, you know, generations long boom in infrastructure spending, because that's, that's a fear I would have. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that fear would be very misplaced. We, in transportation, we actually have an aging workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so even, even before we got this big influx of infrastructure dollars, I would say to all the young people I came across, this is a great field to get into. And again, for some of the reasons we're talking about here, it is actually, relatively speaking, a highly, uh, you know, relatively highly paid and unionized sector with, you know, look, I love transportation. I also just think it, it is a great field to get into. And you mentioned some of the, you know, if you, if you care about your city and you want to see bike lanes or, you know, you, you, you want to do something about the aerospace industry, it, it offers a lot of opportunities for a really diverse set of careers. And, um, I think it is a field that will always, always, always need talent, particularly engineers. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, as you, uh, you know, as noted, I, I ran New York City DOT for for seven years and relied heavily on an amazing set of engineers. A lot of them came from other countries. Um, you know, because even in the U.S., as we train a lot of engineers, not nearly enough. Uh, so, you know. I am not worried that once, you know, once we're through these dollars that the field is going to contract. One, I think these dollars will play out over many years, too. I think if we do our jobs right, and I, I hope we will, um, you know, we're going to change the paradigm here a bit. And there will always be a continued interest, I think, in a more robust level of infrastructure investment in this country. So please, it's a great field to get into. And one, one pitch I always make, go on USA Jobs right now, and you can see there's a special link that, that connects to the to the infrastructure bill with all kinds of job opportunities. Um, I, you know, one joke I, I like to make uh, at USDOT right now, if you've ever thought about coming to the federal government, if you've ever thought about coming to, to USDOT, with a president uh, and a vice president who love and care about infrastructure, some great secretaries, some great cabinet secretaries in our administration, and, and all these new dollars and programs, there's never going to be a better time than right now. 
Well, can, I, can I just build on yeah. what Polly said just to expand that to also, right? Like, you know, energy uh, policy, you know, manufacturing. I just came, you know, this morning there was a meeting at the White House around our, like, you know, our, what's our industrial strategy around advanced manufacturing? And we're not talking in terms of like, you know, six month, year long, or couple year strategies. We are talking about investments that are going to last for, you know, decades and, you know, create infrastructure that's going to need to be updated and maintained. And so I think that, you know, we are looking at jobs not, that are going to shift the entire way that we build our economy, not just, uh, you know, temporary um, projects for the moment. New America panels can get you jobs. Um, <laughs> so questions from the audience, please step up. We have a microphone. Sir. Thanks so much for the both of you for being here. Uh, Shailen Jotishi from New America. Um, my question is for uh, you, Deputy Secretary Sue. Uh, I love this blog name, uh, Yes, We Owe a Can. I actually Googled the blog while I was just uh, on my computer. Definitely recommend folks online check it out. My question is actually about that. Um, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit, not to give away the secret sauce of the series, but what are some of the myths around WIOA that you'd like the public to know about and myths you'd like to see dispelled? Thank you very much. Oh, I really, really appreciate that question. I also just want to give some credit where it's due. So the person who came up with the name is actually in the room, and it's my colleague Monica Vereen, who's with our, um, our Office of Public um, A. Is the <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so... I, I really do appreciate that question. And it's not meant to be a secret sauce. The whole purpose of a campaign is to make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, but I'll give a couple examples, right? One is just very much in line with everything we've talked about here today. I, I think that, you know, um, one, one of the things I, I, I like to say is that, you know, this is not your father's workforce development system. It's not your grandfather's workforce development system. It's not a system where, for a long time, the incentive was just to train as many people as possible, um, not necessarily connected to jobs, and not certainly not connected to job quality, right? And so what we measure in the workforce system is what's going to get done. And if we do better at measuring what kinds of jobs people got into, um, how long that job was, uh, you know, how, what, was it a career? Um, what are the intergenerational impacts of, of our investments? I think that it upends the way we thought about workforce, uh, workforce investment. Um, another reason you know, we came up with this campaign is that in my travels as Deputy Secretary, but also in my you know, time in California, I think there are, there, there are just myths. People you know, sort of handcuff themselves about what is possible within WIOA. You know, are we allowed to prioritize equity? Are we allowed to say that we want to measure how many black, brown, uh, API, LGBTQ, uh, you know, workers with disabilities came through these programs. And so wanting to make sure that, that again, the, the programs reflect the priorities that we have. One of the things that we found when we first came in and did a deep dive on equity is that um, systematically, African American um, sort of graduates of WIOA funded training programs end up in jobs where they are getting paid less than their white counterparts. So the, the, the system has to correct that, right? That, that, is, that is reinforcing systemic barriers. It's also it, not the purpose of the program. And so in order for us to be clear-eyed and, 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 and smart about how we do better, um, we, have to be, we have to take a look at what, what, what's possible and we all, what, we're, what we're allowed to measure, what we're allowed to change. And so those are some of the examples, but there will be more to come. Well, I'm with CompTIA, the Computer Trade Industry Association. This is a question for Deputy Secretary Chalkenberg. I think this historic investment, this interesting time we're in, is, is also such a huge opportunity to look at women in jobs. And the sectors we've been speaking to, infrastructure, transportation, tech, construction, tend to be male dominated. And when we look at the jobs and look at the data, thank you, Deputy Secretary Sue, for queuing this up, we do see such a disparity in a category that we at CompTIA have been trying to shift for a long time to get women into tech. What are some of the best practices you've seen to incorporate solutions that we can use to lift that issue as well? Thank you. Th thank you for that great question. And they don't tend to be male-dominated. They are male-dominated. Um, 
and it just an interesting little statistic. So I uh, ran New York City DOT for seven years. I was at US DOT, as was said, in the Obama administration and now in the Biden administration. Both agencies, the gender breakdown is 75% male, 25% female, so federal and local. And it's been that way for over a decade, despite a lot of efforts, I think, to sort of try and change that gender balance. So just to sort of underscore, and in the, if, if you look at particular sectors, maritime, very few women, aviation, very few women. Transit, actually probably the, one of the transportation sectors where you see a much more even gender balance. So these are long-standing challenges. And I've, I've, in the course of my career, you know, tried to work, work at them both at the local and the federal level. And you know, since you're sort of asking for best practices, I'll, I'll give a couple thoughts on it. Um, you know, there, there is no question that I think at the federal level, there's a lot we can do to, you know, as you're saying, nudge, incentivize, and you know, some of the work that we've been doing and working with, with Julie and DOL has been really exciting. It, it is somewhat bespoke work, you know, to get sort of folks that don't see themselves in particular prof professions into those professions can take, you know, really aggressive and thoughtful recruiting, training, and working to make sure that the organizations and the companies in questions have, you know, that welcoming, inclusive culture that's going to keep those employees. And you know, you you mentioned sort of the care economy. I mean, this isn't a transportation-specific thing, but it is also true that obviously um, women for whom still, you know, they are taking on more of the burden of childcare or caring for for aging parents, that can particularly be challenging in fields that have you know, sort of 24-7 potential schedules. If you're driving a train or if you are driving a bus or you want to be an air traffic controller, you know, there's certain parts of the transportation sector that are very operational. And that can be, you know, that can be, you know, and, and, and not much opportunities as we now know for things like remote work. You know, 40% of the jobs at USDOT are not remote work. They are operational. So. You know, I think there are things we're trying to incentivize at the federal level. I can tell you at the local level, it's sort of the same. At the local level, you know, in my time as transportation commissioner, we worked really closely with the local building trades council, with the contracting firms, with our own city hiring process, and tried to, you know, chip away at this issue everywhere we went. I think we've made some progress, but the progress has been still a lot slower than I certainly would like it to be. Um, you know, I also do a lot of work with an important group in transportation, WTS, which is the Women's Transportation Seminar, which is kind of the leading, you know, women in transportation advocacy group. Um, and they do, they have, they have chapters all over the country, and they are famous. You, you may remember back in the campaign, there was the famous talk of kind of for, for when the, um, Mitt Romney was governor in Massachusetts and then later presidential campaign that he was given binders full of women. They came from the local WTS chapter uh, in, the, in Massachusetts. But that's, that's part of the process, is that networking, is that supporting and promoting of women in the field. Um, so I think it's all of those practices, but, but I'll admit we've got a long way to go. We are, we are not there yet. Yeah, I mean, can I just build on that really quickly? First, to say thank you, right? For I, th I do think, the, again, the work that happens completely outside of what the federal government is doing is so key because uh, you know we, we are all going to be needed to get this done. But a couple of really concrete examples is um, without in any way, um, uh, you know, um, I feel like I should let it sit, the comment that we have a long way to go because that's really, really, really important. Um, but in the spirit of there are things happening, right, and like is this a moment where we could really see big shifts because of the investments that we made, but also because of work on the ground, is um, a, a, a group called Chicago Women in Trades. Um, are you all here in the room? Oh. Who've been doing incredible work. <laughs> so let me just put the camera on you and acknowledge the amazing work that you all are doing <laughs> to basically transform you know, women in the infrastructure workforce. And, and there's a model um, that, that you all have done so successfully and we are supportive of your efforts to expand your technical assistance to 10 other states to try to, 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 try to you know, expand um, your impact. So I'm, I'm so glad you're here and we're so proud to support you. And then just another piece in terms of like the, the partnerships between um, organizations, and this is you know, back to um, Polly's roots, but I know that the DOT gave a $110 million award 
to the Hunts Point Terminal Produce Market Intermodal Facility in New York City. And that is um, improving not only the largest food distribution center in the country, but will create a thousand new jobs. It has PLAs, as Polly has already mentioned, um, so much of their funding does, but 10% of their apprenticeship slots, slots are actually reserved for public housing residents, and 15% are reserved for women trained through an organization called Non-Traditional Employment for Women, or NEW. NEW is also funded by the Department of Labor as part of our grants to bring women into non-traditional uh, occupations. So there's a lot of work that we're trying to do across um, organizations, across agencies, to, to, to address this issue, but there's much more work that we need to do, for sure. Um, well, let's one more, last question. Hi, thanks. Um, so October is, as you know, National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. Um, so my question, as you know, also this po is a population that faces ma major barriers to employment, has one of the highest rates of unemployment and joblessness. Just curious to know if you, what you're doing to support this population of disabled workers, but also what's working out there that you're seeing. Thank you. So I'll just mention, again, the Department of Labor, we have a, 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 an agency called ODEP, the Office of Disability Employment um, Policy. And that work, that, that work is um, focused, you know, we've been celebrating NDEAM um, all month, but very much about making sure that everything we're talking about when we talk about equity includes workers with disabilities. Uh, training programs, how we measure equity, um, hiring within the federal government. Uh, so th 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 just, you know, no question that that's, you know, a community that's been left behind also when we talk about communities that have been left behind and where there's tremendous talent that we should draw from for all the building that we're doing now. Let me just add to that and um, sort of dovetailing with everything Julie said and we're, we're cl working closely with DOL, we have our own very robust programs to try and get more people with disabilities into the workforce and, and led by someone, if some of you don't know him, Kelly Buckland, who's our disability advisor DOT, who's phenomenal if you don't know him get to know him. But I think another piece of it that we're also putting a big focus on, of course, is access. That has been one of the real barriers for people with disabilities to be fully integrated into educational system. So, so we are very focused. One nice thing from the infrastructure bill, it gave us incredible new funding to make mass transit systems all around the country fully ADA, funding for Amtrak to make all their stations fully ADA compliant. Um, so we are looking for ways not only to help do the training and the recruitment, but also to make sure once you've got the jobs, that as persons with disabilities, you can access them. And that, I, again, another reason I'm so excited about um, the infrastructure bill. We've never had those kinds of dollars, you know, specifically devoted to, you know, particularly fixing mass transit systems, where you know it, it's a multi-multi-billion dollar endeavor to retrofit a lot of old transit systems. I will also just say, just another thing we're proud of at DOT, we're also very focused on the question of access in the aviation sector been a long-standing issue with the disability community. Um, you know, how, how the treatment they get at airports, the treatment they get at airlines, what happens with their wheelchairs, lavatories on board. So we're very focused on rulemakings on all those issues and have put out a whole uh, people with disabilities bill of rights, basically, for, for air travel. So thank you for that question. Really focused on those issues. They're super important. Do you even realize that about the infrastructure bill? Um, you can comply with the law now. Uh, so Got to wrap it up. Thank you so much. This was excellent. I think we all learned a lot. Um, and I will, we, will, we will exit the stage. Thank you, New America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>Great. So everyone, um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you Lauren Thompson Starks of the uh, Department of Commerce, of the U.S. Department of Commerce, which is, of course, another one of the major departments involved in distributing uh, uh, infrastructure dollars, federal infrastructure dollars from across a number of the bills we talked about. Um, in our beginning, I think I mentioned something called the Good Jobs Challenge, which is running through the Department of Commerce, and this is the person in charge of the Good Jobs Challenge. So we're thrilled for Lauren to be here. She uh, in addition to being the lead for the Good Jobs Challenge at the U.S. Department of Commerce, was previously in the Ob in the Obama administration at the uh, I'm getting my but um, at the Obama administration in the U.S. Department of Education. So it's great to have you back, Lauren, and thanks for uh, filling us in on the Good Jobs Challenge. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Mary Alice, for that kind introduction. It's so exciting to be with you today. I am glad to be a part of this important dialogue. Uh, this has been a recovery that has accelerated the focus on job quality 
elevated the need and urgency for strategies that will advance economic mobility for more workers, particularly workers of color, uh, women, low-income workers, and others facing labor market barriers. What is so exciting is that as we've moved from addressing the immediate crises unfolding uh, earlier on in the pandemic, we are seeing an increased opportunity for policy investments that are about meeting this moment longer term. And so I see this, and I'm excited about this, as a moment to think forward, a moment to think about strategies that are nationally scalable, locally driven, and equity centered. We have a historic opportunity right now to strengthen job quality and worker voice, really resonates with the comments you've heard today and my colleagues from Department of Labor, and to use these investments to build workforce systems that are more aligned, more coordinated, and that help workers, businesses, and communities thrive. So I'm excited about this moment, and I view this through the prism of a program that was launched at the Department of Commerce and funded through President Biden's American Rescue Plan. And this is the Good Jobs Challenge. It was announced by Secretary Raimondo, uh, our 32 awardees, which are scaling place-based strategies and launching uh, partnership-based approaches across 15 industries. There's a substantial focus in this portfolio, over a third of which is focused on infrastructure good jobs. And so we're very excited about this investment. Uh, there's examples on the Economic Development Administration website that you can view, uh, but really, you know, have, for example, the Ohio Manufacturers Association, which recognizes the imperative to address demand for firms of all sizes. We'll launch an entry level and earn and learn model across 16 industry led sector partnerships statewide. Uh, we also have Philadelphia Works through its infrastructure sector partner launching a building and construction pathway into well paying union jobs that's focused on local underserved communities. Uh, I just also want to note a few key elements of the program design and this resonates with themes you've heard today that are really that this is a whole of government approach to equity, to job quality, and how do we create more force multipliers like these funds that are about bringing more stakeholders together and building stronger ecosystems. So a central focus of the Good Job Challenge is that it's equity centered. We are excited that all of these projects are demonstrating an intentional focus on bringing community-based partners, local nonprofits, other leaders to the table, that this funding can be flexibly applied to deliver wraparound supports like childcare and transportation, language supports. And we're also excited about how this reflects a focus on strong integrated coalition. So uh, we have 99 backbone organizations. This includes economic development organizations, workforce boards, higher education institutions like HBCUs and community colleges, local government partners, labor unions, as I noted, and other key stakeholders coming together with employers. We received over 800 letters of commitment from employers across these projects. Uh, an, another component, as I, as I noted, is that this is really about breaking down silos. And so uh, I'm excited about this mindset shift, this moment to go from competition to collaboration and to a mindset of systems change that's about this is ours to solve together. So we're eager to, to, to be a part of today's dialogue, but also to continue the discussion and to really learn from all of you and your leadership and the models that you're working forward on to ensure that these investments are going to create economic mobility, not only for today's community sport, but for future generations to come. So thank you so much. I do want to acknowledge the sort of the variety of different perspectives we've heard so far. We've heard uh, from a mayor, we've heard from three separate federal agencies. Um, and I think it's clear just how much work and how much thought is going into this big challenge of driving good jobs through infrastructure investments. Um, and this is especially true, I think, for the, the work that we're trying to do around uh, building good jobs for people who've been historically shut off from them. And this is something we've heard time and again through this conversation. And we should name specifically racially minoritized communities, LGBTQ plus workers, uh, and women. Um, outside of, and then alongside of this great work happening at the state, federal, and local level, there are hundreds, there's an unbelievable amount of work happening among nonprofits and community-based organizations um, who've, had, who've been working for decades in many different capacities to drive investment, to drive high quality employment uh, through our manufacturing and through our built infrastructure. And we've got a great panel again to close us out today. Um, we're hoping that their work will show you how uh, good jobs can be produced through infrastructure investments, um, how this work can manifest in practice, 
um, and then some of the distance that we still have to travel. Um, I'll go right down the line with introductions, um, then I'll come back to you to provide like a little bit more a little bit more granularity on the work that you do. Of course, it's hard to encapsulate it in one 45-minute session. Um, Lark Jackson is program director for the National Center of, uh, for Women's Equity and Apprenticeship and Employment, which is a national technical assistance initiative housed within Chicago Women in Trades. Um, we met her briefly on the, on the live feed here. Um, Chicago Women in Trades, we should note, has been a key steward of uh, the funding available through the U.S. Department of Labor for many years uh, under the Women in Apprenticeship and Non-Traditional Occupations funding. Miranda Nelson, second down here, is National Director of Jobs to Move America, which is a national research and advocacy organization dedicated to building policies and public decision making uh, to support good jobs in the manufacturing sector, especially through community benefits agreements, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. Finally, Nancy Luke is Deputy Director of Building Pathways, a nonprofit based in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, de dedicated to the recruitment, the retention, and the advancement uh, of marginalized and underrepresented groups in the union building trades. Um, building Pathways and Chicago Women in Trades, I should mention, um, are both members of the National Task Force on uh, Tradeswomen's Issues, uh, whose work I'm sure we'll hear about today. On the tables throughout the room, too, you can see some of their uh, work products. Um, so I'll go back down the line, starting with you, Lark, um, just in two minutes or so, just the quick broad strokes before we get into discussion of what your organization's working on, how your work connects to this overall objective of driving good jobs, and worker, po and worker power through our infrastructure investments. I know it's hard to do in two minutes. <laughs> what a challenge. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for New America for having me here, or having Seawood here, and also thank you to uh, Deputy Secretary Sue and Deputy Secretary Trottenberg for their support. So uh, Chicago Women Trades, we've been around since 1981. Um, our local arm, which is based in Chicago, we run our technical opportunities pre-apprenticeship program that um, helps give women the foundational skills to enter the unionized building construction trades there. We have our welding program, which often gets women into careers in manufacturing, so we're continuing that work. Um, but we also support tradeswomen retention services. We even have a tradeswomen leadership council because tradeswomen are at the center of our work. Um, and developing their leadership skills is, you know, uh, extremely important to us. Um, in terms of the infrastructure investments, uh, we are a part of the National Task Force for on Tradeswomen's Issues, um, and we have been a part of amplifying, really supporting, and um, finding ways to implement the oh, finding ways to implement the um, framework for promoting equity and inclusion for women and people of color working in the trades on publicly funded infrastructure projects. Again, that document is probably on your tables. It contains 10 components um, for making sure that equity is embedded um, in this massive $1.2 trillion infrastructure investments, right? We know that there have to be um, some goals that we set, right? So, so I won't go through all 10 points, but I'll go through um, just three of them really quickly. Um, one of the most important ones is we want at least one half of 1%, so 0.5% of all federal and state funding, um, infrastructure funding, to be devoted to supportive services. And when we're thinking about supportive services, it goes beyond just, you know, transportation assistance. It goes beyond just tools and boots. All those things are super important, but we're thinking um, about pre-apprenticeship investment because we know that providing those foundational skills um, through pre-apprenticeship is a strong pipeline for women to, to get into these male-dominated industries. Um, we also uh, advocate within that 10-point framework uh, technical investments in technical assistance to make sure that those job sites that general contractors and subcontractors are running are harassment-free, right, and safe environments for women, people of color to really thrive, right? Um, we know one, one thing that Nancy knows, uh, Tradeswomen are often, especially tradeswomen of color, are often the last ones hired, first ones fired. And we want to be a part of um, transforming that. So we know technical assistance is super important. Um, the other key third piece that I really want to highlight is community monitoring of um, the goals that we set on these public fund funded projects and monitoring them at least twice a month, right? So we want to go beyond best efforts, right? And we want to make sure that it's a community stakeholder monitoring system. So not just uh, federal and state um, and local you know, agencies monitoring, but also tradeswomen-led organizations being a part of that monitoring, tradeswomen themselves being a part of that monitoring. Um, 
So that's just a snippet of some of the work we're doing. We're doing a, a lot more in terms of expanding our pre-apprenticeship, but Thank you for I'll that introduction. It. Yeah, it's clearly a lot, and we'll, we'll, luckily we'll be yeah. able to get a little more into it, too. Yeah. Miranda, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. Thank, thanks so much for having me. Um, I uh, also want to appreciate uh, Deputy Secretary Sue, who is still in the room for, uh, with us, um, who shouted out Jobs to Move America earlier, um, and our work on, on the New Flyer Community Benefits Agreement. So at uh, Jobs to Move America, we um, think about one piece of the infrastructure workforce in particular, which is actually the manufacturing workforce, which is building lots and lots of equipment that we need to make our infrastructure work. We're you know, build, building buses and building trains and um, building components for all sorts of new green technology. And um, as, um, as Mary Alice said earlier today, that workforce has been really depleted over the years. And while these manufacturing jobs used to be really good union jobs, they're increasingly precarious. They're increasingly done by temp workers and they're increasingly non-union. Um, and we are really fighting to try to turn that around, <laughs> to make sure that we are manufacturing um, goods in this country and that they are providing good jobs and that there's equitable access to, to those jobs. Um, and one of the tools that we are using to do that is we're taking the concept of community benefits agreements, which were first developed as really a tool to get um, community benefits out of real estate projects um, and bring them to the manufacturing world and say, hey, this is another big development in a, in a community, a factory. Um, can we organize to make sure that those factories are bringing good jobs, that workers have a voice on the job, and that there's equitable access to these jobs and hiring and training programs for them? It's, it's you know really important to draw out too. You know we have a pretty broad. We're talking pretty broadly about the skilled trades here, and it's there's a very clear linkage between the works that Jobs to Move America is doing around electric vehicles and the sort of climate imp implications of our infrastructure investments as well. It's a really interesting point. Uh, Nancy, last but not least. Hi everyone, Nancy Luke from Building Pathways. Um, thank you everyone who has graced the stage already. I was doing a lot of nodding from the audience. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that's important. Yep, that's what we're working on too. <laughs> Can't wait to talk to you after. Um, so the key things that we work on are trying to get folks that have traditionally been left out of the building trades, especially union programs, into union programs. We see it as the fastest way to career a good job with benefits, with union protections for folks. If you don't go the college route, even if you go the college route and decide it's not for you, we want to make sure that you, you can not only have um, a job but a career and thrive, right? Um, for us, it's a, we work on a supply and demand model. So we work to make sure like through our pre-apprenticeship program, through our Northeast Center for Trades, Women, Equity, through our Build a Life campaign, um, we have a lot of programs, through um, a Mass Girls in Trade program that we're creating intentional spaces for folks to like learn, grow, and thrive to see that they're not alone, that there's a movement behind them, especially like for the girls, like teenage girls going to a conference where at their school they might be the only in the carpenters program or the only in sheet metal. And then they see that there are hundreds of other girls across the state that are also in these programs and that the tradeswomen come and support them and say like, no, you're part, you're part of the work, you're part of the movement um, is really important. We, we recognize, and people have named it as an issue that sometimes women, people of color, don't, if they can't see it, they can't see themselves being it, right? So outreach is really important in our communities. Making sure folks are telling their stories is really important in our communities. Creating a space where that once you are in a program, in an apprenticeship program, uh, as a woman, that we have Trade Talk Tuesdays where you can come and support each other. This is what I'm experiencing. What are you experiencing? And then you stay and talk to those career seekers and tell them, like, you know, this is, this is my path, this is how I got into trades, this, this is how you can, we can support you, and working through that um, is really important. And then on the demand side, thinking through what policy work, right? Thinking through how do we use city ordinances to move the work in a real way? How do we use infrastructure money? How do we use PLA agreements um, to move the work in a real way? Um, so yeah, that's what we're, in a nutshell, working on. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nancy. And it's, yeah, it's really interesting to hear that specific, you know, that specific strategy. And one of the things um, my colleague Taylor White mentioned, some of the work that our team has done recently around inclusion in the skilled trades, especially with focus on youth. 
And we've mm -hmm. heard about the importance of looking at both that sort of bottom up from the worker level perspective, empowering workers, and then also driving structural change from the top. Um, so hopefully we can get a little bit into that. Um, today we've already heard um, a bit about the types of strategies that you've worked on. I think you know, the, the sort of big models that we're hearing from your organizations, big topics of conversation already in our discussions today. I mean, we've talked about apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship as racial and gender inclusion strategies. We've talked about community benefits agreements. We've heard about the importance of childcare for working and learning parents. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important to recognize, and we've already acknowledged it today, um, about these different models is that they've actually been around for quite a long time. These different types of work have been going on a long time. CBAs have been uh, around 20 or 25 years, depending on which you count as the first. Um, there was a goal for 6.9% of all federally funded contracting hours uh, to be performed by women, set in 1978 in the Carter administration. Um, the, uh, there's a, a printout on the tables here about uh, child care for apprentices. And the Oregon uh, Department of Transportation, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us today, um, have provided a $2,500 per month per child subsidy for child care since 2010. So these are, these are, pieces, these are you know, efforts that have been around for quite a long time. And I wanted to ask you, and I'll start with you, Miranda, based on your experience working on these strategies, as you've done your work over the past few years, and we've started to have more and more conversations about job quality, uh, about inclusion, about worker power in construction and manufacturing, what progress have you, have you seen? Um, and I can ask you more specific questions, but as a, as a general sort of sense, have we seen a lot of progress in the past few years? Well, I think, I think for us at Jobs to Move America, we absolutely have. Um, we have really focused on getting community benefits agreements in the uh, electric bus industry. There's, there's five companies in the electric bus industry. We now have community benefits agreements at three of them. And a fourth company uh, is already providing good, good union jobs, so we um, didn't focus on that one. Uh, so that's, that's, we think, a really good, really good setting for the industry, right? And we really think about that in kind of contrast to the electric car industry in, in our country, which um, is not, uh, is largely becoming a low road industry. We have tons of different non-union factories opening up. And, um, and we're, you know, while it's incredibly important to transition our, our cars off of fossil fuels, um, the further investments in the Inflation Reduction Act are gonna continue to go to these non-union companies unless we do something about it. Um, one reason that we've been able to drive so much change in the electric bus industry is because of government intervention. Uh, this is an industry that is pretty much exclusively selling to government agencies. <laughs> and so government has, so we have worked with a variety of, of government agencies to demand real standards in their contracts and make sure that when they are contracting that they are asking what kinds of wages and benefits are you paying and rewarding companies that are paying good wages and benefits and rewarding companies that want to really invest in, in hiring and training programs. Um, we, uh, we, without that kind of government investment and government levers, it would be so much harder for us to, to do this job. And you know, I think that's really true of CBAs overall. A lot of the big successful ones in real estate development happened because real estate development needed something from, from the government, right? Whether it was a rezoning or some sort of investment. And, and so I think that, that pairing of um, the organizing of the ground and the organizing of community organizations and unions with, um, with real government power to, to drive up these standards, I think is, is a real key to, to success. And I, I wonder if I could just ask another yeah. question about that sort of coalition building that you mentioned. You know, everybody who we've got in the room today, everybody who's watching online, obviously are interested in the workforce development aspects of this discussion. They're interested in technology. They're interested in, in labor organizing. They're, everybody else is all, we're also members of communities ourselves. So we've got communities that we live in that are going to benefit from infrastructure investments over the next few years. How do, how do we do a good job as neighbors of organizing in our communities to make sure that these infrastructure dollars go to support, go to support good things for our, for our neighbors and for our communities? Well, I think it's, it's really important um, to be really intentional about who we're organizing and make sure that a variety of groups have, have a seat at the table. Um, in, uh, in the coalition we built in, in Alabama, where the, the, new, factor, the new flyer factory is, is located, um, we, we brought together groups that kind of 
ran the gamut from, from labor unions to environmental groups to religious groups to, uh, to groups that were focused on, on the workforce. Um, and I think having all those perspectives at the table really, really helped us to, to push forward and to win. Um, and the other really important thing, um, and is, is one that our, our executive director, Violin Janice, always highlights, is that we, we shouldn't settle. <laughs> we should make big demands, and we should be trying to win the big demands so that everyone can really benefit from, from community, from investment in, in our communities. And, and so, like, don't, at, when we were negotiating our, our new flyer CBA, there were a couple of times when, uh, when the company offered something that was uh, good for labor unions, but not for the community. And then there were times that they offered something that was good for the community and not for, not for workers. And so there was a real understanding among the coalition that if we hung together, um, that we could uh, get something that could be good for everyone. And that is what we eventually got. Um, and, and so I think really being able to build strong organizations that stand in solidarity with each other is, is important. We're, we're a little bit behind time, and I, I wanted to talk about this, but I think maybe I'll just let the audience know that uh, Jobs to Move America has some really fantastic resources, almost sort of toolkit, cookbook type things for building CBAs. And it's the US Employment Plan, and I think there are some other toolkits available through your website, too, to talk about. Sort yeah. Of sort of yeah, so the, on, on our website, you can read all about the US Employment Plan, which is the tool that we try to get um, agencies to adopt when they're buying these, these manufactured goods. Um, where they look at wages and benefits and really reward companies that are, that are doing good things. Um, and then we talk about how to organize in, in community together to, to negotiate CBAs like, like the ones we have. Um, and we really see them as paired. As I said, we need the government levers to get to the good community benefits. And such a huge part of some of the great CBAs that we've seen, of course, is apprenticeship training. Apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship as a way to connect neighbors and residents to good jobs. Um, so, Lark, Nancy, I want to ask both of you, just because you're both doing so much work on, on apprenticeship and other work-based learning pathways, um, how have you seen work-based learning models serving the communities where you've implemented them? Like, what, have been the, what have been sort of the tangible outputs there? Yeah, I guess I can start. Um, so, you know, Chicago Women in Trades, I talked a lot about, um, or earlier I mentioned that we've been around since 1981. That's locally in Chicago. Our national center, which I'm a part of, we've been around since 2016, and we've really focused on you know, seeding programs nationally, um, seeding pre-apprenticeship programs nationally, providing that technical assistance to industry stakeholders nationally. So um, one initiative that I want to highlight um, is the Women in Non-Traditional Careers Initiative located in Philly. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder collaboration um, that seeks to uh, increase the numbers of women in the skilled construction, manufacturing, transit, and um, utilities industries. Um, and so I remember four years ago when we, you know, were literally, you know, all meeting in the Philadelphia Workforce Board's um, conference room. It was maybe 20 of us. Um, fast forward, you know, four years, we have a mailing list of over 600 people. We now have, um, we finished our second cohort of a tradeswomen readiness program. And those women um, are entering careers in the, uh, the unionized construction trades in Philadelphia. Right. We also developed a mentorship uh, program to accompany that um, tradesman readiness program. So every trainee was paired with was was paired with a current um, Philadelphia area tradeswoman. Right. So just think about how um, that support helps. Right. A prospective tradeswoman. Think about the um, uh, support that they. I, I think about the support that they were able to get through supportive services. So like work boots, tools. Um, career guidance, right? Um, career outreach, career education. Um, so, so much of the problem that I see is on the, you know, at the very like baseline level, it's just like lack of career education and outreach. Mm -hmm. Like you would be shocked at like how many um, women, you know, um, who come up to me and it's like, if only I had known about this career opportunity when I was 18. Mm -hmm. You know, or I've been taking toasters apart my whole life, or I've been, you know, um, dismantling equipment, you know, just for fun. I didn't realize that there was a skill set associated with that, right? Um, and so I say all that to say, um, really, the investment in pre apprenticeship, um, special shout out to the Women's Bureau and the WANTO grant that's allowed us to, to build that um, multi stakeholder collaboration, to build that programming. Um, 
you know, that's the, that's the type of progress that we're seeing nationally. Um, locally in Chicago, we uh, just launched, or just finished, sorry, our first uh, mill rights class with the Carpenters in Chicago, women-only pre-apprenticeship program. We are launching a women-only pre-apprenticeship program with the iron workers locally in Chicago. We are building a, um, a national mentorship model um, with the bricklayers and allied craft, work, craft workers and also the Iron Workers International Union. So, you know, I've been able to see these things slowly build and obviously, you know, um, uh, as an organization, we've been able to, you know, see these victories, but I think we're just at this like really momentous moment, not only with the infrastructure investments, but just with the desire to have pre-apprenticeship programs um, from registered apprenticeship programs like coming to us and want to collaborate. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think there I have a couple of things, I think reflections just come from that. But I wanted to, to Nancy, I think just ask you the question we discussed a little bit before the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're talking a lot about, um, you know, how we get women into, into skilled trades occupations. And it's so, so important because I think this is a statistic from uh, here to stay from your report, the your recent paper. report, yeah, yeah. which I couldn't print out. We ran out of paper, apologies. <laughs> um, there's, there's tremendous progress recently getting uh, women into skilled trades. Still only 3%, 3.5%, I think, of the, of the construction mm -hmm. workforce. Um, Nancy, when you're thinking about uh, you know, the goal of getting more women into the trades, how does that connect in with a, with a racial justice agenda in infrastructure investments as well? Right. Um, so we're seeing that while all our efforts to make sure that women know that it's possible to be in the trades, there are pre-apprenticeship programs like Building Pathways that will help you and support you. That there's um, the Northeast Center for Trades Women Equity that will help and support you. It's also about what you're experiencing on the job site. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, like the culture. We still need have a lot of work to do on shifting the culture of job sites. So for us um, at Building Pathways, we're working with the new, we're working with Oregon's tra Trades Women um, to work on Rise Up, which is like a respectful workplace. Made, made and designed by the construction industry for the construction industry to address these issues. And then also having the intentional spaces of groups like, um, like the Tradeswomen Tuesdays for folks to talk about what they're experiencing so that we can address it. For, for, for spaces for like um, the policy group on tradeswomen issues to talk about what's, like in that space there are stakeholders from the construction industry, the tradeswomen, um, like um, government to hear and reflect on this is what's going on what can we do like how could you help us in shifting it so that's what we're seeing in um, as a struggle and and ways to overcome that struggle and so thank you so much for sharing that I think one of the things that struck me I think from from the work of Chicago women trades and from the work of building pathways and again you, you know it seems like you collaborate a lot in really important ways um, you know that there's a, sort of an effort to help women and help communities, especially women of color, sort of see themselves in skilled trades occupations. Absolutely. And then there's also work of getting through it. Once you see yeah. yourself in it, persisting in it, yeah. which is just as important, it seems, because it can even go awry if you've, you know, if you've started in it, but it doesn't work out well. Um, I want to stick to, I think, this sort of, you know, we've, I really appreciate you all diving in. Again, I'm sorry, we're a little bit behind time. Um, I do want to encourage everyone in person and online to be thinking about questions. There is an online chat function you can submit. I promise we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, but we've talked today a lot about strategies that work. Um, that's been, I think, the main focus of our, of our discussion. Um, things that we're optimistic will work, things that we're pretty sure will work. Um, Deputy Secretary Sue mentioned the importance of keeping a clear eye view. Deputy Secretary Trottenberg talked about uh, expanding our view of what's possible, what's feasible uh, in our work around good jobs. Um, and it's, impor it's important to be honest, too, about the things that haven't worked or the things that haven't worked quite yet. Um, and I wanted to save a little bit of time just to talk about those things briefly. And we've already sort of touched on some of them in discussion, but maybe just sticking with it on the apprenticeship side, the apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship side, um, we know that it can be extremely, extremely difficult um, to make construction work sites safe and welcoming uh, especially for women, for LGBTQ plus populations, and for people of color. What still needs to happen if we're going to fully dismantle these structures of gender and racial equality on construction work sites and on manufacturing work sites in this country? And this is a big question. Right. I let you know it was coming. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> I, I, have some, I have some suggestions. 
I think, um, you know, we talked about federal money, right, that's coming to the states and what's being written in and required. And so requiring um, programs and cultural change like rise up, having stuff written in for child care and what that looks like. Having stuff written in even for like pumping stations, I know like people don't think of that, but like, you know, new moms coming back to work um, are thinking about that, like where am I going to pump? And should I still be, am I still going to be able to pump? Um, I think that like the cultural shift will happen when we are not only doing the curriculum and doing the respectful workplace trainings, but there are like, there's some type of way for there to be accountability, right? Like if you're not meeting these goals for um, women, people of color, on the job, what, what happens? Mm -hmm. If you're not creating a respectful workplace, what happens, you know? Um, because then it gives teeth to the legislation, gives teeth to the policy um, for us to really try to push for women to be like, no, it is a good job. No, you'll be respected. No, you, should, you will stay and thrive. So. Anything you'd like to add, Lark? I really I like the idea that sort of, you know, we're talking a lot about enforcement and monitoring, too. I think that's obviously an important sort of part to, to consider. Sorry, Lark. Yep, you're great. Um, I agree with everything that Nancy <laughs> said. Um, I would even add like uh, just one piece of you know better collaboration between like groups um, and the OFCCP, right? Just making sure that again things have teeth. Um, and again, I'm just I want to kind of think about the micro like you know community based level. Like I, investments in technical assistance is so essential. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and making sure that, like, one thing, for instance, that CWID does is that, you know, for our like bystander intervention training or our sexual harassment prevention training, like, we, um, you know, we encourage and oftentimes <laughs> require um, leadership to attend those trainings. Right, mm -hmm. we provide train the trainer um, of train and trainer piece for them as well, so that they, they know how to also administer those trainings. Um, Technical assistance has to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has to be valued, right? It has to be invested in because that is also going to like really change the culture shift. In addition to those, that teeth, right? There also has to be that other side of like training on how to provide like you know just health and safety for women in construction, for instance. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it there. But I just yeah, if and, you want to yeah, and I mean it's good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, well, yeah. No, I agree. I agree with what Lark said. Like, I think that's why it's important that all levels of construction, from the workers to the owners, are all held accountable and all, all trained up in respectful work sites. Um, and I also think, like, I, I know it came up about, like, thinking about barriers. What are the barriers that would prevent women, moms, single moms from participating? I don't think it, it can be an afterthought. I think it has to be very intentional as well. So when we look at childcare, we're looking at, um, like we sit on the task force, right? That's trying to address childcare, so like um, care that works. So we're looking at non-traditional hours. We're looking at how expensive it is. The most expensive state is Massachusetts for childcare. And thinking of like, how can we reduce those barriers? But if we're looking at it and we're doing a pilot program, how can we push the construction industry to look at it with us? How can we push them to put money behind it? How can we put, push like money to be written in for infrastructure for that? And also, um, like the mayor um, from Minnesota said, um, Rochester, Minnesota, um, said that it also has to be like a good sustaining career. So we're also at the table thinking of that because it impacts can women participate in our program if this doesn't exist. And some wonderful points about technical assistance. And I wanted to just highlight a resource from you all. Um, it's the, the finishing the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great resource. And this, you know, I think it resonates with us, you know, thinking about youth apprenticeship, we think about different stakeholder communities that you have to engage in different ways. Um, you've got this resource, which has basically six different sort of, I think it's six different sort of targets. So for, uh, for managers, for uh, frontline supervisors, for subcontractors, for city government, you know, different ways to provide sort of an, an equity framework and to drive equity through construction in construction work sites. Yeah, and I think it's been mentioned from everyone that everyone that's been on the stage, it's going to take us all. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, from where I sit in the community, what can I do to drive this forward? And so then, oh, you don't you don't know? We we have a manual for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Yeah, I just also um, just really thinking about the the lens of like women of color in the trades. Um, so the here to stay briefing paper at the very end has um, a list of uh, like ten recommendations, and one that you know as I speak with register construction registered apprenticeship programs in particular, and I'm you know walking them through these recommendations. One that, that like I can almost see like a light bulb go off is like. Um, our recommendation that you have an ombudsperson, so like an mm -hmm. like an intermediary person, right, who can help, um, you know, help that woman of color on, you know, navigate any challenges she may be experiencing on a job site or within her apprenticeship program, right? And it, it seems like on the surface, so you know, such a simple idea, but it's, you know, I think just us having the ability to provide these recommendations, to provide this technical assistance, I've seen it really be helpful because you do see those light bulbs go off. You do see people it start resonating, right? Oh, that is an option, right? And yeah, it sounds like a, a long-term project. It's a lot of different sort of, uh, you know, areas of technical assistance, types of education and yeah. learning. Um, Miranda, I don't want to give short, short shrift to CBAs. Um, just, you know, as, as quickly as we can, you know, JMA and a coalition of your national partners has been uh, really successful in building locally and economically targeted hiring into the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is a huge, huge victory. Um, there are still state and federal regulations that keep federal expenditures from doing as much as they can uh, to support communities and local workers, including union workers, through infrastructure investments and procurement. Um, when you're thinking about what's next for CBAs, where are you thinking? Yeah, so that is a a huge point of concern for us. Um, so these federal regulations for a long time um, made it impossible for cities and states to use federal money and hire locally within their communities. Uh, we changed that in the infrastructure bill uh, for construction jobs funded through the Department of Transportation, which is a great first step. But the infrastructure bill just itself funds huge investments in broadband and water and sewer infrastructure and there's Still, these federal regulations are still blocking the ability to do local and economically targeted hire um, in, on those programs, which we see as, as a huge problem. And so we're really fighting to, to change those regulations um, to really open up the ability for cities and states to do the kinds of in building in of incentives that we, we've been talking about uh, to make it easier for um, our communities to win community benefits from this. Thank you so much. Um, we have very little time remaining, but I know there have probably been a lot of great questions that have come to mind from our fantastic panelists. Does anybody have a quick one? <laughs> this is a tall order, I know. <laughs> um, hi, all. Uh, someone earlier made a point um, that we do a really bad job with career education, um, just broadly, but as it applies to this panel in particular. Um, I agree, I used to be a high school teacher, so I've got that perspective. Um, I'm now on the community college team here at New America. Um, but I'm just wondering from you all, like, where should that burden of career education lie? Um, it feels like, like your groups in a lot of ways are picking up the pieces of like, a system that doesn't do that well. Um, so I'm just kind of curious of any, any thoughts there. Everyone. <laughs> That's my answer. It should lie with everyone. I think, um, you know, when we talk to guidance counselors or when they come, like our Mass Girls and Trades conference is, is specifically for juniors and seniors in high school, right? As they're thinking of like, what's next for me? And for some folks, it's not college. And so for it's not college, does that mean we stop talking to them or we don't find what their career could look like or, or what their life's gonna look like after high school? For us, it's no, right? And so um, thinking about for girls that are in like career tech high schools, making sure they know that there are good union jobs out there that you can be a part of. Um, and so, like, the, the guidance counselors that come sometimes aren't the ones that are working directly with them, and so we're educating them too, like if you have anyone else that you think of. Or if it's, you know, for youth that are not involved in any type of program, right, the 18 to 24 year olds that are not engaged in stuff, but they're, like, you know, they were, um, returning citizens or engaging the justice system, who's talking to you about what's next for you? If we're, if we're thinking about, uh, everyone, <laughs> if we're thinking about traditional high schools too, right? I don't, I'm, I'm very much about like, you know, like if we want to uplift the community, we want to make sure we're reaching as much of the community as possible, and how do we do that? And so, like you said, uh, Michael, like we're all part of a community, 
And if it's like, you know, announcements at the church bulletin, if it's flyers at different community centers, just thinking about how we're making sure that everyone is thriving in our community. I'll quickly add to that. Agreed. And one example I can give you is actually the Philadelphia Workforce Board. They actually have on their website a tab for the Women in Non-Traditional Careers Initiative. So it's not just, hey, you know, we're, we just need people to find jobs. It's like, no, this is actually a hub for Philadelphia area prospective tradeswomen to really do a self-assessment to figure out if, you know, one of these non-traditional male-dominated career pathways is for them. It's for them to hear tradeswomen stories. We have a Today's Rosie podcast on that, um, on that website, on that, that tab. Um, and again, special shout out to Philadelphia Works. Like they have taken such a, a massive leadership role in the career education and outreach piece. Um, and I agree, like one, one thing that CWID does um, when we do trainings on outreach and recruitment, like best practices in outreach and recruitment, is we also um, work with uh, construction and it, not just construction, but registered apprenticeship programs um, to train them how to, how to use CBOs to do their outreach and recruitment, right? How do you educate them about your trade, right? How do you actually, um, you know, give them the, the, the facts of your trade, give them the, the benefits of your trade, right, so that they can work with their community and essentially be your recruiters, right? Because <laughs> recruitment is a lot of work, but, it, but it's, it's so important. So agreed. It has to be a community effort. It has to be multi-stakeholder um, because you're just going to reach such a diverse talent pool that way, mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Miranda, any last words? No, I'm just no? <laughs> very inspired by the work of my co-panelists. And very inspired by you. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Folks, I'm afraid we are just out of time. Um, I think we could spend a whole day, a whole week on this topic, <laughs> obviously. Um, I want to acknowledge the uh, massive amount of uh, so, you know, support that we have for this effort in communities across this country. It's hundreds of practitioners. Um, I think it should inspire excitement and resolve for what's possible, what needs to be done um, to build our, you know, revitalize our built infrastructure, secure our climate future, secure the future of work for American workers across the country. I want to thank the 200 or so people who joined us online and to all of you who joined us in person uh, in the audience. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, before I turn it back to the founder and senior director of New America's Center in Education and Labor, Mary Alice McCarthy, um, I want to thank our three panelists. Clark Jackson, Miranda Nelson, Nancy Luke, uh, for joining us today, for sharing your experience and your expertise. And I wonder if I could ask you to join me in a round of applause. <laughs>